You're on the six screens element work, earning the reputation of giving all the right ingredients, uninhibited, and exposing the hard, cold facts about the Watchtower Society. <laughs> Disney. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome into our Six Queens live programming tonight. Uh, we're glad you're with us. Boy, I'll tell you, it's a cold, rainy night up here in New England. I hope it's nice where you are. But I have to tell you, we are so happy. We feel so warm-hearted to see the Watchtower organization in final freefall. They are collapsing big time. But anyway, we have a program on here tonight that is exposing the Watchtower. And it's dealing with loneliness. Uh, when you were with us, especially when you just fellowshiped, you could be very, very lonely. But there's also another aspect to that. I know there's many that are lonely that were never disfellowshipped. They never fit into the clique, so to speak. So if you have any thoughts on loneliness, Dick Borgie tonight is going to love to hear from you. So let's bring Dick on. Hello, Dick. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to DC, which stands for Dick and Connie. It's our direct cover from us to everybody in the audience, and we're absolutely thrilled to be on tonight. And I'd be admit if I didn't open up with um, letting the audience know that Rick and Sue are celebrating their 10th wedding anniversary this weekend. And uh, we all wish them the very, very best. So, my. Uh, what me and Connie are working on tonight is loneliness. And um, I, I, I did think it was kind of appropriate. Rick uh, ended um, World News with that situation about a brother in Australia who was an elder that uh, is a pedophile and was caught raping young boys in the congregation. And I would not be surprised to find out that other elders in the congregation do it. I know nothing about the case at all. Rick just mentioned it for the first time. But it wouldn't surprise me if other elders knew it and they were covering it up because Watchtower is really, really good at covering up pedophilia and a lot of um, a lot of nasty sex acts they cover up. Well anyway, what we're gonna be talking about tonight it is loneliness. But I wanted to mention something before we get started. Anne-Marie mentioned something on her program about a month or two ago that she was listening to Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil said that belonging was more important to most people than being loved. And, and I thought about that for a long time as to why people would stay in an organization that has been proven to be loaded with pedophiles, proven to be um, the false prophet, has proven to be a hypocrite, a liar, a fraud. Why do people stay in when 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 they know this? I mean, Six Greens isn't the only um, that you go to find out how terrible the Watchtower is. Just go to your Kingdom Hall. I mean, you can, you'll can you see for yourself why there is um, so many people leaving and all the different scams that get going. And they, they're changing their uh, philosophy on blood. What time was this scholarship thing? Now it's just what? It's a matter of conscience, which seems a little, a little ridiculous. But... Uh, Dr. Bergman had a really nice book out, and what he told us in the book, what, and he's a psychologist, and he told us in the book that people had high anxiety in the watchtower. And they were the only ones that really had that. They had this belief that Armageddon was right around the corner, get your go bags ready, Armageddon is going to be so bad, so terrible that. It wasn't the days were not cut shot, no flesh would survive. And they hang that over the heads of Jehovah's Witnesses. And and that's lonely too, because 
you're the only one in society, in human society, that believes that. So, you know, you go, oh my God, you know, I could tell the whole world that I'm getting coming. But wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't tell them I'm getting coming because 16 times the Jehovah's Witness organization was forecasting Armageddon coming, preferably 1975, and it didn't come. That's going to make you feel really, really lonely. Angry, upset, confused. Those are other adjectives that Armageddon not coming at 75 caused. I can remember um, to 1976, uh, my former girlfriend came in. Uh, I, I met her at the gas station, and she was with her new boyfriend, talked on Mustang convertible, really nice. And she just yelled out to me, Dick, Dick, we're still here. I be angry, but it also made me feel lonely. I mean, I was like, I'm all alone here, except my JW friends. Um, all my other friends, they did kind of turn their nose up at me because I was telling them they had to repent and become a Jehovah's Witness and not to get saved. And, you know, I thought to get invited to parties and all my friends, they like, just kind of like picked up me. I didn't get invited to anything anymore. But I was kind of good with that some degree because, um, you know, I could go to JW, but JW on gatherings, but they really didn't have any parties. Uh, that, you know, I mean, I, I shouldn't say they didn't have any, but they were very, very few. And if you're a single guy, as I was, you know, age 21, 22 years old, you know, there really wasn't anything that you could do. And you know what? You really couldn't ask a sister out on a date because, for well, one, I wasn't baptized yet. I heard about that. And the other one was, if you see a sister you like, you better be thinking about marrying her. You just can't go to take a girl out to the movies like I do still with lots of lunch or go out and have a few drinks and dance. You really, really can't do that. So it certainly does, you know, make you feel lonely. Okay, folks, start next. Um, were you ever lonely in the White Tower? Come on in, let us know your story. Car six. Nobody wants to hear me talk all night, I'm sure. Okay. The one thing that um, I kind of relate to um is being in the military. Oh, sir, we can... Yeah, good, please. Go ahead. Yeah, fine. Yeah, Dick, right? How are you doing? Good, yes, yes I'm good. How are you? Um, I just want to, you know, give you a little input. Is that okay? I love it. Okay, yeah. Well, you got a strong point. I must admit, yeah, Joe's witnesses and the Watchtower Society make you feel very, very lonely. And me, as a kid and a teenager growing up in the Joe's witnesses and the Watchtower, I felt very, very lonely. No question about it. And I never really felt like I had any real friends. I mean, you know, you got friends, but I came to the conclusion they weren't really true friends. They weren't real friends at all. They were fakes and phonies, pretenders, suck ups, and kiss ass people. Does that make sense to you? It does. Yeah, because most of them, that's what they all are, 100%. They're not your friends, they're not your family, and truthfully, they never were. And they never will be. And I, I finally came to that conclusion. Um, before I left, and of course, after I left, that now they're, they're not the real deal. And I remember, you know, I was just lonely. And after I left the Joe's Witness, I still was very lonely, very, very lonely, very, very depressed, very, very frustrated, very, very angry. Oh, very, very angry. Had a lot of resentment. And to tell you the truth, I even had a lot of, a lot of hate. I'm not kidding. A lot of hate and even a lot of vengeance or revenge in me because they treated me so very poorly and very badly. So they're, they're bullying, and they're very abusive toward me. They bullied me, they abused me, they were very controlling. They're dictating my life and, you know, trying to tell me what to do all the time and, you know, making all the choices and decisions and, and doing all the thinking for me. And I'm telling them, no, no, hey, you can't do that. I can make my own decisions. They, you know, but no, no, they're, they're going to push you around and bully you. And they, they threaten you, okay, well, you know, you, you walk away, you leave, and you don't do it our way no more. We're not your friend anymore. 
So that got me winding up being very lonely. And the so-called fake and phony, you know, bullshit friends I had told me, you know, okay, kiss off. We don't care what happens to you. We don't care if you suffer. That's your problem. Come back to Jehovah. We'll be your friend. Other than that, we're not going to be your friend. We're not going to associate with you. We're not your friend. Nothing. Just go, go suffer. And if you don't have any friends, well, that's too bad. You know, if you don't have any friends, we don't feel sorry for you. That's, that's your problem. Because maybe you don't deserve any, what they tell me. So, too bad. You know, kiss off and and and, uh, and you you don't deserve anything until you come back to Jehovah. So that's how they thought, you know. And I said, yeah, I was telling you, you're not being fair. So I still wanted to be friends, but they didn't want to be friends. So it wasn't my fault. They wanted the ones who threw me under the bus and you know and and told me to kiss off, and they wanted nothing more to do with me. And you know, basically, were blowing me off. Well, I wanted to be friends, so I, I can't be around to blame for it because I, I, you know, they didn't want to. Be and that's usually the attitude of Jehovah's Witnesses. That is their attitude. And, uh, you know, when they, when they found out I, did, I was left all alone with no friends, they they're like, they tell me, well, too bad. You know, you deserve it. And that's just, that's evil. That is downright evil. But, you know, like I said, that is the way of, of cults, of all cults, for that matter. All cults operate like that. And it's definitely the way of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Washington Society. Now, does any of this make sense to you, sir? It makes a lot of sense to me. I'll give you one better. One thing that they do, you think, you did a good job, well said. One thing that they do, all the cults do this. All the cults do this. They take the carrot in front of you. Here's the carrot. I'm getting this. One, it's way. It's, and you know what? You make it do this. I'm getting it. You're going to have a new body. You're going to see your loved ones again in the resurrection. Oh, yeah. Paradise Earth, you know, uh, everything's going to be beautiful and everything's going to be wonderful. And God loves you, Jehovah loves you, and so forth. But we do something that's wrong and we don't like it, we can just fellowship you and you have no chance. I won't say in hell, but. Darren moved to Minnesota, 
you know, because we're in Chicago, keep in mind. Um, I, I didn't, I, I mean, I did contact him for a little while, but then when he learned and his father learned, you know, Ralph, that I was doing nothing more than the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I left it, I wanted nothing more to do with it, and I was out. They didn't want to be friends no more. They told me that we're done. We did, so they, they told me to kiss off. They just kind of, they bailed on me. They bailed on me. They threw me under the bus and just blew me off, blew me right off and ghosted me. And that was it. You know, I mean, I know they wanted to move on their life with other things, but still, we, we could have been friends. I still wanted to be friends, but they didn't want to be. So the sad part was, you know, I mean, you know, I, over the years, there was a couple times here and there I got in contact with Darren, just nothing regular and same thing. With Ralph, there's nothing regular because they, they would wanted nothing to do with me. And when I wanted, you know, if I ever need to get in touch with them saying, hey, when you're in town again, let's hook up. You know, let's meet up. Let's, you know, do some stuff together. Yeah, that'd be great. And they, they would make every excuse in the world why they couldn't do it. Every bullshit excuse in the world why they couldn't do it. Didn't surprise me at all. So, unfortunately, I wanted to share, and you can maybe let Sue know this, because she knew both of them. She knew Darren and Ralph uh, uh, fairly well. and. Uh, last year, uh, exactly uh, a little over a year, just about 13 months ago, Ralph passed away. Um, he was in a, a nursing home for about six or seven years of uh, diabetes. He had already had both his legs amputated. And he, he died. And Darren, that for true, nine months later, just this past November, also had diabetes. And he had congestive heart failure. He wound up in a nursing home. And then he died. And so both have now passed away. Um, and it was that Darren was only a few months older than me. He wasn't very old. Um, and just like that, yeah. Darren, like I said, yeah, Darren died in November. And it's very sad, but, you know, so now they're gone. I'm still around. And uh, so what the hell? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it, so you, you kind of, you, you see what the hell I'm, I'm saying, sir? Do you understand what the hell I'm talking about? Well, well I, I certainly do. I mean, I have two sons that haven't talked to me in 30 years. So I, I, I know. I know. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, and you know what? That's okay. Um, you know, my my faith uh, carries me carries me through. Um, I'm a man of prayer. I like to pray, and um, I I feel good. You know, I, I mean, yeah, it's lonely as as far as being fun most, but um, I get to be on six streams, and I get to be able to practice. By faith, uh, I go to a non-denominational church. Uh, yes, yeah, it's called Set Free, and there's a lot of Holy Spirit in it. I've heard some wonderful sermons, and uh, we're meeting Christian folks all the time. And um, I, I think what you do in a situation like that is just pray for the Holy Spirit to take you to a church, and He will. And He will. Christian church to go to, make sure it's non denominational. That's the bottom line. Non denominational. Anything non denominational, I prefer to totally avoid and avoid all cults, any and all cults, and any other false religion out there because there's way, way, way too much of that. And that's the truth. Well, I can say with you on that. I certainly do. I certainly do. There's way, yeah, there's way too much. And, you know, I just, who, who needs it? They, you know, and it wasn't fair. You know, girls, when they, they throw you on the bus and make you feel lonely, and then you are lonely, and they don't care. They, just, they don't care. They don't give a shit. They're like, they're, they're actually, they're, they're happy. They're very happy that you are. They think, oh, that's your fault. That's your problem. We don't care. We don't give a shit. They're happy. Then they just go live their happy life. So they say, and if you suffer, you suffer. And they don't care. They do not care at all. They don't give a shit. Trust me when I tell you that. Does that make sense to you? Mark, it makes a lot of sense to me. I'll tell you why they don't care. First of all, that organization is full of liars. It's the governing body. Yeah. Are, uh, yeah. They're more professional liars. They make a lot of money lying. If you look at if you look at the history, you know, go back to C.T. Russell, to the funnels I get up there now, it's just fraught with lies, false um oh, false statements, um so many times there's sixteen times that Armageddon was coming. But that organization is run by Satan's devil. And Satan loves to break up the That's one of them. He does. That's the pot gold is. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Just to break up families. So, how this is crazy. But the fourth and fifth commandments, just to honor my father and mother. Well, you know, I 
made myself the I mean, I did everything that I could possibly do monetarily and emotionally for my boys growing up. I lost them when my oldest boy was 13 and my youngest was nine. And, you know, I, I tried to see them. I brought them down cars. I, I wrote them. You know, I did everything that I could do. I two jobs. But, you know, I did all, all I could do. And now they can't talk to me, even though the, the Jehovah's Witness said you can't talk with this fellowship person. What is, what is, you know, when Moses came down to the mountain, it was heads and stones, number four, all of my father and mother. And well, the Jehovah's Witness, you know, that's correct. You know, we, we, we can override that because we're the governing body. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the governing body is what they all call this, you know, big time, you know, total, complete power. They got all this power, all this control, and that's who they are. Then that's what they're all about. Power and control, sir. Power and control, 100%. And they, and with an iron fist, man, that's how they rule. With total power and total control. And that goes that way for all cults. All cults operate like that. That is the way of all the cults out there. That's how they operate. And that's the truth. And, and, and all of them, including the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Society, are Satan's organization. They belong to Satan. They are satanic. They are demonic. They are just fairly Satan's organization. And, and I hope that, I hope that you, you do agree with that. Oh, I certainly do agree. Do agree. They always, you know, appear as the angel of light. Exactly. But the okay. you got to remember it's the leadership of this organization, even down to the elders. Uh, you know, we, we explain the elders quite a bit on this program, but I will tell you this. It's the wheat and the weeds, you know, that Bible story, you know, that, you know, in the Bible talks about, you can't differentiate between the wheat and the weeds until it comes, until it's completely grown out. When you have good elders, and you have a lot of bad elders, but a lot of I don't, I don't have a share of the weeds. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times, the good elders get corrupted by the bad ones because they feel they have to come for them because it's enough to protect, you know, Jehovah's name, which is, exactly. you know, yeah. which is anyway. Exactly. Well, I, I, I just want to give a chance to anybody else. Stay in the bullpen if you would. If you want to come, come back on in 20 minutes or so, I'd love to have you. I just want to give somebody else a chance. Thank you, Mark. No problem, Dick. No problem, Dick. But yeah, you're doing a great job. And you know, I like the show. You're doing a great job. And Rick did a great job at his show tonight, too. Rick, and I want to also thank Rick for making that special announcement for me. That was very kind and generous of Rick to make that special announcement for me of what I'll be doing in the future. That was really helpful from Rick. So thank you. Thank, tell Rick, I said thank you so very much, Rick, in every way. Rick Farron and Sue Farron did the best of the best. Without a doubt.
but that was an overwhelming sense of loneliness. Then the next major thing of loneliness I can I can think of is when I got a divorce. And I remember the crushing loneliness because you know, there's like this poem called it's like you know, looking across the room, you know, look hoping that your eyes meet somebody that you're like, what this is from the divorce thing. That hoping you can meet somebody's eyes to meet you and you can you don't even have to say a word, you just know. You just know each other. Or having a hand reach out for yours, you know, and, and you probably know what it's like too, because you went through a divorce. And I was still I still loved my husband. I really did. Even though he wasn't the best husband, but we were kids, you know, when we got married and then we had two kids and then we got divorced, like most of the other witnesses our age. But I just remember it was, and even in the kingdom hall, you're, you're told that was your family. And even, you know, even in your own family, you could feel lonely, just like, you know, you, you expect your family to really love you, even when you're a witness. You don't always get that genuine love from your own family that you would like to have. And then you think you've got all these great friends that are in the quote-unquote truth. And then if you move or something, or if any gossip goes around about you, whether it's true or not, or anybody knows anything about you or not, they get no past judgment on you, and then all of a sudden, overnight, all your friends are gone. All your family that was the witness is gone. And yet, it's very lonely, in or out. Of the, you know, being the witness, in or out of marriage, in or out of the family. Anyway, that's that's very lonely. And a lot of us ended up in a lot of therapy and having our stomach pumped from having pills we overdosed in and things like that. And it's all because of the mental anguish that we all have been through at one time or another as a witness or since we've not been a witness. Anyway, that was just my thought. Well, I think that's a, a good thought, and I always, I do think we all got encouraged by that. And, you know, if you think about it, when you become a Jehovah's Witness, the first time you walk into the kingdom hall, and you get love bombed, everybody loves you. Then you get baptized, and everybody is scrutinizing you. What kind of car you drive, what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of house you live in. Um, the job that you have, is your wife working, is she not working? They want to know everything about you, and you're always being corrected. And yep. another thing, I don't want to. The other thing that, that I found is that when I was appointed a ministerial servant, like all of a sudden I was in a new clique. I, I started to fit in with the other ministerial servants and the elders. I was a member of the servant body at my kingdom hall. I got invited to more things, uh, more dinners. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, I was I was lonely. Or me and my former wife weren't lonely, but the other people that weren't Jehovah, that, excuse me, that were Jehovah's Witnesses, but weren't appointed to anything. They weren't pioneers. They weren't elders or servants. You know, it must have been lonely for them because they really didn't do much. And people didn't bother with them much. It seemed that if you, if you wanted to get noticed in that kingdom hall, you had better be going out in service. You better be turning in a lot of, you know, a lot of time. You better have a lot of Bible students. If not, it could be all full lonely just to be, let's say, a Jehovah's Witness, a single mother with two kids and had to work, she's not going to have time to go out and service and nor she got to have the, the money, to, you know, gasoline's expensive. And if you're a single mother with kids, it, it's difficult. And, and those are the people that really could use encouragement and they get shunned. 
you know, not a real hard shunning like a dystopia person would, but you know, people don't they know how it is. They don't, they don't bother with them. Star six, the yes, no comments on loneliness in the watchtower and what causes it and how do you feel about it? Star six. How do, you, how do you feel? I mean, does it make you feel a little weird sometimes when the governing body keeps changing things? They change your position on blood. You know, um, at one time you, you just saw a shift, and another time, you know, right, right now you wouldn't be. You have know, fractions of blood and all that crazy stuff. Don't you think that the, the people in the world, especially the American, they know that, you know, as a Jehovah's Witness, you know, a doctor, a nurse, or anybody, you go into a hospital and, oh, is it Jehovah's Witness? No blood, you know. Well, wait a minute. No, no, we can't have blood. Well, fractions of blood. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Doesn't that make you feel lonely? I mean, you're in this cult, and everybody's looking down at you with disbelief, and to some degree, a large degree of chagrin. They just, you know, that doesn't make sense. How come you can't have blood? You let your nine year old kid die you know, during surgery or a car accident or something? That, that makes you feel like not a part of the society that is a fabric. I mean, you know, it's, it's a society of, of America. Dar any comments? I know what to say. Good. Yeah, hello, Mr. Borgie. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. It's nice talking to you again. Uh, before I forget, I didn't know that you said, uh, mentioned it. I want to wish Mr. and Mrs. Fair a happy anniversary and many more. And may God be with them uh, all the time and so forth and not just part of the time. Okay, I just want to comment. Uh, a church that's worth any of its salt and everything like that, and especially in ministry school, or if even if you don't go to ministry school, would always teach you, you know, because I, I heard a minister say one time, you're never alone with the Lord. And I always liked that comment, whether I agreed with the rest of his philosophy or not, and so forth. But a church that's worth its salt or anything like that would teach you how to cope with loneliness, how, how to cope with circumstances when you are alone, because you're going to be alone, you know, sometime. You're not going to be able to have the rest of the uh, fellow members with you and so forth, but you're going to be alone at times. And they, they teach you how to cope with it, how to handle it, and so forth, and uh, everything like that in a diplomatic manner. Watchtower society does not. Uh, they pretend, you know, like they're your friend and everything like that until you cross them. And then they throw you out and uh, you're there all alone. You just wonder where uh, all your friends went or if you had any friends at all and so forth. So, uh, yeah, Watchtower society it's nothing but a lonely road and everything like that. And if uh, you follow the Watchtower Society, you're going to find out that uh, you're going to be all alone and so forth. And the thing is, they're a phony religion, you know, through and through. Well, I certainly are, Ken. Thank you so much for the comment. My lovely wife is um, feeling a little better, so there's a topic that she wants to uh, address about um, loneliness in the lunchtime. So here's my beloved boy, Connie. Hello, everybody. I'm a little froggy tonight, so excuse me. I've been sick with the uh, cold and flu this week. <clears throat> so I just basically wanted to say in terms of the uh, subject on loneliness, when I was in the organization, I was a single sister, and it's not discussed all the time, but it's something I would really want to bring up tonight uh, for those sisters who are single who are listening in tonight. You know, when you're in this organization, as you know, 
excuse me, there are more there are more sisters than there are brothers in the organization. And that in itself is very unfair for the sisters as far as being able to want to find a brother to date or possibly marry. <clears throat> and then, as you know, when it came time for the conventions, you know, the conventions in the summer and so forth, you know, the young people would be circulating around <clears throat> in the assemblies. Excuse me. And they would be, you know, looking to have an opportunity to meet somebody who was single. And it's very, very lonely being a single sister in this organization. I, I can't tell you how lonely it was. In my congregation, we were really fortunate. We had probably we had a lot of young people. We had a lot of young people that were really musically talented. So, you know, that was a real gift when it came to gatherings. But when it came to um you know, the sisters wanting to um, meet somebody, it just wasn't there. We did have about eight sisters who got married around the time of 1975. You know, Armageddon was coming, and it never did. And so a lot of sisters were getting married instantly. I mean, even as young as 17 was one sister, another one that I was very close to. She dated only three months, and he was married. Um, not really, but I'm just saying she's still married to this day. And anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is <clears throat> when you're in the system, yeah, um, just you know, touching on that. I'm oh, sorry. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Twenty six tonight, and she was very gracious to come up and, and try to get on. Uh, I, I just wanted to can't really say too much about um, being a single sister and having no brothers, but uh, you know that were they just weren't macho men. That's one thing that I, I think Zachary mentioned it or or Gil, but somebody mentioned it that these guys there's no testosterone on the governing body. And only one of the governing body members ever fathered a child. And so I would think um, it, it would be really tough for a sister to find a guy that was anything like a man. Most most of the ones that I knew were kind of kind of like see, uh, pussy men. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I get that tickle and hard to be able to talk. So please forgive me for that. Anyway, I was going to say that for the sisters that got married, you know, you're really left behind as a single sister. And there's two camps. There's a camp for married sisters, and then there's a camp of single sisters. And when you're a single sister, you just lost your friendship with that sister that got married because of the fact that, you know, they don't have anything to do with you. They just drop you like a hot potato. You know, there's no phone calls. There's no you know, communication at all. It's like you're a leper. And I remember how painful that was for me because I really loved a lot of these sisters. Uh, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, and a lot of them, they got married and they moved down to San Jose, which was about an hour away from our congregation where we were. And so now you're really limited. Now, now there's very few sisters in the congregation. But the point I'm trying to make is it's a very, very lonely world for sis single sisters in organization. Um, you know, as far as brothers are concerned, there aren't many. And we did not have, I was in the 70s and so early 80s, we did not have any uh, dating sites. And apparently, what's Charlie has now, which I'm very surprised that they do. I don't know if that's still in effect today. I, I have no idea. But, you know, <laughs> it, there's nothing worse. You know, if you've ever done this, and I'm sure many of you have, there's nothing worse than being a single sister or even a brother. And in any organization that is huge, you're in a congregation that's large, you're in a city, you know, everybody wants to feel like they belong, they have a sense of community, and everybody needs that, no matter who you are, witness or not a witness. And when you don't feel like you have that, you know, it's very damaging to the psyche, and that depression comes in, and the depression, you know, 
does not let up until you're able to get to the root cause of the problem. And the thing is about the depression, it is a form of mental illness. And so it's not as severe as schizophrenia or anything like that, but it still affects your mind, body, spirit. Okay, we're all connected. Our mind, our body, and our spirit is all connected. So however you think, like the scriptures say in Proverbs, as a man thinketh, he becomes. So whatever excuse me, thoughts you have that are going through your mind, if they're negative, it's going to manifest itself uh, with depression in your life. And then as time goes on, you can also manifest illnesses. And uh, I just got this book. Uh, I really like to, not necessarily tonight, but we had a friend that was just here last week. She went to this conference it's in Georgia, and it was taught, it was called Be in Health, and it was in Thomaston, like Thomas, and then T O N Thomaston, Georgia. It was a whole week conference, and it's something that I'm absolutely fascinated with whenever it comes to health, physical health, or mental health, or emotional health. I'm very, very fascinated in that field because, you know, we all want to have the best quality of life that we have, that we can possibly have. And my friend, she went to this conference, and the originator of this conference, her name was Dr. Henry W. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And the name of the book, and she gave us a copy, and I started reading it. You can get it on Amazon. I would really highly recommend it. It gives you a lot of insight because uh, there's a lot of sisters that have fibromyalgia. Uh, Rick has even said that. You think a lot of circuit ulcers why? And you think, why in the world? You know, why fibromyalgia? Well, it has to do with the spirit of fear. That is connected to the, the spirit of fear. And the name of this book is called Exposing the Spiritual Roots of Disease. And it says powerful answers to your questions about healing and disease prevention. So I'll I'll get into that sometime because we can have a whole discussion on that. You can learn a lot from that. But the whole organization is about fear and anxiety. But on this tonight that we we're talking about loneliness, you know, there's a lot of people in the world, there's nothing worse than like, it, you know, I remember the days when I was working in Air Freight. Uh, I've done a lot of different kinds of employment. In Air Freight, they're open 360 days except Christmas and New Year's. But they're open 24 hours. So you're working like a dog, and, you know, you're going to the meetings and everything. And yet you're exhausted from work, and you're exhausted from the meetings and everything. But you never really get an opportunity to meet anything. So... The point I'm trying to make is, isn't it interesting how you could be in a world that's so large, it's so large, and then yet you feel so isolated in, in the world? Well, this is what we want to talk about tonight, is the loneliness that's in the JWs. And my heart goes out to any of the single sisters. We know that they have the short end of the stick when it comes to being able to find, you know, a good quality brother. My conversation I had with you a couple of weeks ago was don't focus on finding a brother. Focus on yourself and developing yourself the very best way you can. Go get an education. Then they'll really get to know who you are and, and what you really want to become into in life. And your life will flourish. It really will. It will flourish and you'll find that that loneliness just dissipates. But Anyway, I just wanted to share that with regards to the sisters who are female in the congregation. And then, unfortunately, as you know, that if you go out and date, you know, someone who's worldly, then you're marked. Then you're marked in the congregation. So you're really damned if you do or damned if you don't. And, you know, a lot of young people today, it's, it's, it's very sad how the organization sets people up that way because it shouldn't be that way. People should be having very happy, fulfilling lives. So this is what we wanted to talk about tonight. And then of course, you know, this is the fellowshipping and this association, you know, that brings a lot of loneliness. Uh, and, you know, you talk to people with your family and friends and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have anyone. 
And then if you if you're raised in the organization, that's a whole different that's a whole different thing than someone like myself who is a convert. You know, you like not trying to be disrespectful, but you like the food in the classroom. You don't celebrate Valentine's, you don't celebrate birthdays, you don't celebrate Christmas. So when all that takes place in the classroom, you know, the teacher knows you want the whole class to feel like they belong, that they that they're all together as part of the class and having a good time. But then the JW parents tell the teachers at the very beginning of the school year that they don't want Joni or Susie participating in any of that. So unfortunately the, the son and daughter, who's the JW, you know, is following mom and daddy's advice. And they have to go to the library and they feel very isolated. And you know, that takes a lot of um it takes a, a, a tremendous amount of um I can't hear the word right now, uh on, on children. It just has a lot of wear and tear on on children. What happens is that they don't really get to feel like they belong. So, you know, they feel isolated. It's really no fault of their own, it's their parents' teachings. And yet they have to comply because they're under 18. And many of them leave when they're 18 years of age. They said, I've had enough of this. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that you will find that JW children, they don't really learn the social skills that the average person learns. You know, when we have like, uh, ballet classes, or you're taking piano lessons, or uh, you know maybe football or tennis after school or whatever. You know all the activities that normal normal kids do. The JW miss out on all that. And what's really sad is you know there's there's a spirit of competition which which can be healthy. It's not all detrimental, but it also teaches the children to be social. They learn social skills. So it's not unusual when you find a JW who's literally in their 60s and if they're out of the organization, they, I mean, it's really sad, but it's true. They do not know how to make any friends. And so, you know, Watch Start has a direct impact on all of this because God created us all to be very social beings and we really do need one another. So, you know, I just wanted to say that tonight. And the other thing I was going to say, one last thing. I was not born in, I was a convert. So my family were not JWs. My mom was studied, but she never got baptized. And so I became acquainted with the witnesses. And I was 18 at the time, and I studied the truth book. And I got baptized 10 months later um, at the age of 17. But the point I wanted to make is my family were not witnesses. And so this is the other flip side of the coin. Uh, my, I have four older brothers, so one's passed now, but when it came to, like, my oldest brother's birthday, I did not participate in that. I did not go, and I know he was really hurt for that. And then my, my brother, Johnny, my brother number three, he had a big, gigantic Catholic wedding, and I always wanted to be in one of my brother's weddings. And, um, anyway, I had just gotten baptized, literally. One week before my brother John got baptized, or excuse me, before he got married in this big, gigantic Roman Catholic church, I now, you know, it, it's a full map, is what it is. And I had to turn him down. I couldn't be in the wedding, in the wedding party, is what it said. And so because of that, my brother Johnny and his wife had to sell me. And that was back in 1972. And you know, sometimes you try to do the best you can to reconnect with your family the best you can, but sometimes, you know, people don't want to be forgiven. So, you know, that's very painful. But, you know, I tell you, one thing my mom told me that's so very true. She says, you know, Connie, some of the best lessons in life you're ever going to learn is not going to be found in the textbook. She said it's going to be found in the lessons of life storms and things that you encounter in life. And in my case, I lost my dad when I was 13. I lost my mom when I was 25. I was a baby at the family, so I grew up with older parents. That's why that happened. My oldest brother was almost 20 years older than me. So I lost them. Then I lost all my brothers. Okay. And then when I disassociated myself with the witnesses, I lost all of them. 
So, in other words, I lost absolutely everybody. All I had was my little dog, my little dog, Sammy. I just loved her. She was my best companion, and thank God for animals. But, you know, when you get in a, a dark, deep, dark mold at that point, you got to really, really be careful because suicide is, is right there in front of you. But what I wanted to say to people is, you know, there is hope. Uh, it was very scary to leave the organization, but I knew it was the best thing I had to do. And I don't have any regrets. I mean, I've met, you know, Rich. I've met Rick and Susan. I've met Anne-Marie. I've met Dan and Angela. I mean, we're talking about some genuinely beautiful, beautiful people. And we're not in any kind of bondage or fear. You know, I, I, uh, I make that like an analogy, like, you know, somebody who's a prisoner, you got the orange jumpsuit on and you got the shackles on your your ankles and your wrists and you're in total, total, you know, bondage. You just, you know, you have no freedom whatsoever. It's total oppression. And that's the way cults operate. And they operate with your thoughts, with your mind, and it's all fear-based. So on another time, I am going to talk about this book by Dr. Henry Wright. Exposing the Spiritual Roots of Disease, the powerful answers to your questions about healing, healing and disease prevention. And friends, you can get this uh, at um, Amazon. It's not very expensive at all. Um, my friend gave it to us as a gift. And uh, it, it's amazing. It talks about fibromyalgia. It talks about a lot of stuff and how it's all originated from stress, from fear. It's the spirit of fear, anxiety. And so anyway, you know, we love you very much. We want you to have the best possible life you can have. We're certainly here for you. And you really don't have to be lonely. Uh, we're here. We hope you chime in now. I'm going to turn the phone over to my husband. To my, to hey, my Ryan. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ryan. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sister. Yeah, hi, Debbie. Hi, I'm really hey, sorry. Well, you leave it on that. I can't imagine. I've only got one little brother. I'm not little brother. In a couple of days, he'll be 59, but he's still my little brother, you know. And, it's just, um, and I almost lost him to a massive heart attack not too long ago. And I just, I can't think of what do I do. I mean, I've got grandkids, I've got kids, and I, but my little brother, I just couldn't imagine. Not having him, even though I've not seen him in like 14 years, we talked on the phone all the time, you know. But that that would be absolutely devastating, I believe. I mean, he's not a witness anymore. We've we've got a really good good relationship. I mean, when our parents died, we can deal with everything. I just trust him completely. And I just really thought you had to go through all that. And you know the yeah. book you're talking about? Yeah. There's another uh -huh. book that's similar to that. And it's yeah. called Feasting. Feeling is very alive, never And mm -hmm. it does the same thing mm -hmm. about the, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you one more time? Mm -hmm. so one more time. I didn't quite get the title. But it was, it's it was really buried alive, never mm -hmm. die. Okay. Yeah. And it, it a lot of stuff goes back to anger and yeah. uh, fear and, and because what is it? Depression that it's anger turned inward. And exactly. mm -hmm. and, and you're mm -hmm. when you turn that inward, well that that's gonna create um well, I said that anger but never mind. But if you want to, like a lot of autoimmune diseases but your body is making antibodies against itself. Your body turns on itself and it creates all these illnesses and diseases. And you can literally think yourself sick. But you can all, yeah, sometimes you can think yourself way better too because compared to where I was, I can't, I mean, I'm still not that. In perfect health or anything, but even with as bad as my health has been, I think I'm doing 
doing really good because I was supposed to be dead a bunch of times, you know. And I'm still living, and I plan on just living at least so my great great grandkids, you know, have kids. Anyway, you know, I've got a long way to go. I'm only 63. Yeah, well, I appreciate knowing that, honey. I, I'll just read a little bit here what it has to say about fibromyalgia. Because, you know, the doctors don't have a cure for fibromyalgia. Uh, it, this is what it says. Fibromyalgia is a stress and anxiety disorder. Its classic symptoms are pain in the muscles, ligaments, and connective tissues, fatigue, and chronic insomnia. Now, that's got to be horrible. When you can't sleep, that's insomnia. But it's chronic insomnia. And that's that's very serious. If you don't get your sleep, you can actually die. You, you can hallucinate. Anyway, it's as many, uh, excuse me, women make up 99% of the people diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And it says, thankfully, we have seen countless women healed from this stress disorder. And and then it goes on to say, it affects women who do not feel, and now it's getting to the spiritual roots. It affects women who do not feel covered, protected, nurtured or safe and they're always looking over their shoulder they are driven and anxious moving the pieces of their lives around to try to find some security and stability that they feel is not coming from their husbands or their fathers anyway it's saying here that the spiritual root behind fibromyalgia is the spirit of fear and it produces anxiety stress drivenness and perfectionism now, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. If that's not Watchtower, I don't know what is. Okay, because a lot of chase actors are trying like crazy to be perfect, and the whole organization is always about you got to do more. You're not doing enough. Yeah, it's all about image. You're not doing enough. You got to do more, 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 more. And it just and army just just around the corner and the go bags. You know, we know the drill. So that's the spiritual root that's behind fibromyalgia. And it says <clears throat> fibromyalgia is triggered by the spirit of fear in a realm beyond our conscious awareness. And when we struggle with the spirit of fear, okay, which is all watchtower, it disrupts our body systems and initiates nerve impulses through the hypothalamus, which is in the brain which senses there is a problem upstream in the soul and the spirit. Fibromyalgia does not have a known cause or cure in the medical community. And then it just goes on, uh, you know, he's referring to scriptures and everything as well. It's a great, great read. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I mean, you know, the thing about, about Watchtower, it burns people out. People are just, they can't do enough. He gets into gastrointestinal problems, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, uh, leaky gut, GERD, which is acid reflux, migraines, chronic insomnia, asthma, overeating, and he talks about getting to the root of the problem. Anyway, I will share more with you in the future, but uh, it's, my friend went to this conference. It's called Be In Health. It's a week-long conference. They have it all the time. Then they had a part two as well. And she said it was just absolutely fabulous, really fabulous. You got to get to the root cause of what's causing your illness. And it, it starts with, you know, there's a lot of sisters very depressed. A lot of sisters, as we know, suffer from uh, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. And that's really just putting a band-aid on the illness. It doesn't get to the root cause. And excuse me, the scary part about all that, all that medication from Big Pharma goes right through your liver. All of it does. And the purpose of the liver is to detoxify any kind of poisons or toxins in the body, alcohol, medications, drugs, anything. That's the purpose of the liver. And it's, it's a fabulous organ. We only have one of them. But the thing is, you start continuing to take all this medication on a regular basis. And let me tell you, there's a lot of sisters that are taking this, this crap, okay? And they're trying to cope with the very best that they can, and yet they're not. And the thing what ends up happening 
is that there's serious side effects down the road. Okay, the problem's not resolved. Your health, your health is going to demise, is going to diminish very seriously. So I think it's wiser just to get to the root cause. And that's where you have to look at yourself and say, okay, why am I feeling this fear? Why am I feeling this anxiety? Why am I feeling this stress in my life? What are the causal effects of it? And what can I do to address them? And you got to take a real good look at yourself. Maybe it's, maybe it's your marriage. I don't know. Maybe it's your kids. Uh, maybe it's, you know, the organization. Maybe it's all of the above. Maybe you just don't feel good enough. There's nothing worse than feeling like a failure in life. There's nothing like that, you know. And the organization loves to feed into sisters' minds on that. I mean, let's face it. How many of the sisters are out there going, um, you know, with the cart witnessing and door to door? It's mostly the sisters. It wasn't the men. So anyway, that's just what I wanted to share tonight. And we'd love for anybody else to call in. And thank you for listening to us tonight. Sorry, let you call me. Yeah. Um, um, you were you guys were talking about um, what was the topic again? I'm sorry. Well, t- 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 uh, loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I-, I have something to say about loneliness. Um, I- I've experienced it my whole life, inside and outside the watchtower. Um, when I was a teen, I never fit in. Uh because I'm the type of person who says what's on my mind at any moment. Like just, uh, I try, it's finally taken me years of experience to, to be a little more um, careful, not not for other people, but, but for myself, so I don't get hurt, you know? Uh, don't go for people that for once in your life, you're supportive of the president, it's Donald Trump, but I digress. Uh, with the witnesses, I was always saying things that pissed them off or doing actions or, or like, uh, I never did the shunning thing. And so I was the black sheep in my family and the black sheep of the congregation. And my wife as well, too. We both never uh, shunned. And we just, uh, they didn't like us. They picked on us and they bullied us. And uh, my wife and I separated for a little while. And then um, I was disfellowshipped. And... Um, while I was disfellowshipped, I lost all of my friends, but I was really fortunate or lucky or whatever that my cousin, um, who was never baptized but raised in it, um, he, he, uh, my parents kicked me out of the house and he gave me a place to say, stay. And he didn't just do that. My cousin Brad, he saved my life because he gave me friends, camaraderie, uh, a, a really good friendship with, with the friends that we had. We played poker together and, smoked pot and drank a little bit. None of us got too carried away. Uh, these guys were family guys and did it on Saturdays or Fridays, Friday nights. And, you know, they were hardworking family men. And uh, we all, we all um, did a little business together. And, and we, um, we, we just, we were close. And I'm appreciative for that. My cousin Brad passed away. And my family had the audacity not to tell me. And um, I was always lonely when I was, when I was fellowships, but at least I had that. Now the second time I got the fellowship, uh, my wife got the fellowships with me too, and it got much more lonelier. Uh, less friends. Um, my cousin had developed a heroin addict, a heroin uh, problem, and part of it was the organization. My uncle, his dad was uh, abusive to him, uh, him and his brother really bad, and they both had drug problems. They had to go. It ended up causing uh, my the death of my cousin, uh, not heroin, but he uh, blew his liver out and he was still drinking. And because he wasn't sober, they wouldn't give him a uh, liver, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, not the, uh, a transfer of a liver to him. You know, they, they couldn't give him one. Um, so he passed. And um, amongst all this that's going on for about 10 years, I had absolutely not one friend, not one family member. And um, you, depression, you want to talk about depression, depression hits you really bad. I mean, when, you're, when the only guy that you know is just that guy that you met at a bar that you've known for a long time who's your weed dealer, and that's it. And that's the only person in my contact list. And um, uh, both my wife and I have, uh, on separate occasions, uh, us not being in the room with each other, tried to commit suicide. And we've been suicidal for a long time. And um, 
it, it wasn't until about a year ago this uh, Thanksgiving when I met Rick and you guys from Six Dreams, and um, I didn't. I, now I've had more people in my phone book than anybody to talk to at any time um, than I ever had. And I think uh, that the point that I'm making through this, and maybe you guys agree too, is that um, it's been proven that isolation um, in, in the prison systems actually like does not reform you, and it makes things worse, and it does cause depression and suicide. And um, and the watchtower are doing this to us there because they didn't even give us a fair fight. They took everything from us. They emotionally blackmailed us, and they told us that everyone was worldly, so we were stuck with the a very tight knit group of people and friends and family, and that's it. And then when you lose them, you have nothing. And to be in total isolation, I tell you, I they say I don't wish it worse. I don't wish it upon my worst enemies. I do wish it upon the governing body. I want them to know what it's like. I want them to know what, what it feels like to be completely isolated. And and it's not like Desiree and I are murderers, you know, or that we did anything bad. Uh, my wife, her person was. Um, Lying. She said uh, they wanted to know where she was at a certain point. She said she was with a disfellowship person and she got the fellowship for that. But she was really at a rock concert and she went without me. And she just didn't she didn't think it was any of the business and she didn't want to tell me about it. And it, 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 yeah, I don't care. I'm not mad about it at all. I, it's just it just goes to show that the elders, they have no insight and they have no idea what's going on. But I thought it was a really good topic, and I'm sorry if I went on a little too long, but it just kind of hit some heartstrings. No, but um, we appreciate your comments, so I thought we were apropos. And, uh, you know, please feel free to come on again. But what me and Connie are working on right now for down the road is we are going to be talking about things that are psychosomatic and how things, the way the watchtower treats people, causes a lot of mental illnesses, physical addictions, and then something else we're working on that you don't hear too much about in the churches, you're certainly not going to hear about it, um, in the Watchtower, is about demons. And we're taking courses on demons, how they work. It's a good idea to know who the enemy is and how the enemy works. One of our... Um, uh, General Generals with General Patton, and how he got to be so famous is that he beat, he beat a famous German general named Rommel, and how he beat him is he read his book. Rommel wrote a book after World War One, and uh, Patton read it, so he knew he was he knew the guy moves, and that's how the Seventh Army, I think it was, uh, was very successful uh, during. North Africa campaign. So we want to uh, inform everybody on on how um, the demons work, the different names of them, and, and you know this structure. But that is down the road. Right now, we're just talking about the mental illnesses in the Watchtower. And I, I, you know, our theme tonight is is loneliness. I remember sitting at my the foot of my son's bed and reading my book of Bible stories and the children's book. And you're reading these books and you're realizing that, you know, the bedtime stories is where parents really connect to their kids. I mean, you really, you tell those nice little stories, the three little pigs and, uh, you know, you know, Easter egg hunts and all that stuff that you tell kids. And to make up the kids are like, Armageddon's coming, it'll be the worst. Uh, and if you're not close to Jehovah, you'll be killed. The ground's going to open you up and squall. You see this picture? That can happen to you if you don't, uh, if you're not a super uh, JW. So you, you make sure you go out and feel service and you do all the stuff. You be quiet at those meetings and you don't make a, you just sit there as a seven year old and you sit in those meetings and you don't. Say a word, you don't move for two hours. You know, I mean, it's, it's, no wonder why when the kids grow up, they don't want to be part of the JW. You know. But anyway, well, I, go, I, I just wanted to conclude um, one point and just say that um, I really like like um, listening to you and Constance, and um, I really appreciate you and Rick and Susan and everybody that has a 
a voice on here, um, the, all the audience members and everybody, because we, it is it is a place to heal. And it's a, and Rick, Rick, Rick and you guys and all of us, we show what true Christianity is to the witnesses, because this is true love. Um, even if we disagree with each other, we still show unconditional love. And that's all I got to say. Love you both, and you're doing a great job. Love you, too.
and see it would be only um, a blood relative on your left side if you're angry, then you would have cancer on that left side. If it was a non-relative you would, and you were angry and bitter and resentful, you would get breast cancer uh, on the right side. The right side could be a man or a woman, but um, and it could, a non-family member, but on the left side, it's always just a woman that you're angry and bitter with. So um, then if you would for, forgive and let that person off the hook, they discovered that they it suddenly and suddenly the tumor or the cancer would just disappear just like that. And then if you took the anger back on again, it would come right, it could come right back again. And so it was the most interesting, but they have all the diseases they figured out. Um, so we got into groups and then we could go to put this big fat book put together by doctor, scientists, psychologists, and we would just say what problem this person in our group was having, write down what it said, and then the encyclopedia, take it back to the group and discuss it. We would all pray about it. Um, we would get to the root of it, discuss, you know, the whole thing. But they would know, like, like this one guy had a tumor, and it come to find out everybody who's ever, ever had that type of tumor was always the same situation every single time where they were fired from their boss, they were rejected, this whole scenario. And every time they would get this particular type of a, a tumor, and then by, by like, letting it go, it would, it would go away. So it's most incredible science, and um, it, it, he had us one time in the conference room, huge room, about 600 people, men and women, and Henry Wright said, um, I would like everyone to stand up who's never heard their father say, I, lo I love you, and everybody stood up. I was one of the rare people who was still sitting down in my chair, and everybody was just crying and everything, and then they had surrogate dads um, stand up in front and then you would just go down there if you wanted to have your pretend father say son I'm proud of you and you know what I'm so sorry that I, I let you down and but you know what I was always really proud of you and I love you son and please forgive me for not having been able to be you know honest with you and tell you that you're extremely important to me and I love you and then they just men after one man after the other crying their eyeballs out hearing these surrogate fathers say these kind of things to them, whatever came to their heart to say. Oh, it was just tear-jerking. But um, it was the most incredible conference. I, I highly recommend it. And they really do understand the clusters of demons that work together in our lives. And for you to understand that, like Connie said, and get a handle on how they work together and to know your enemy so that you can defeat it. But the main thing was um, unloving spirit um, because everything has to do with love and um they want you to not love yourself and not accept yourself. That's really the bottom of it and the root of it. And um, so I couldn't speak highly enough of it. And um, they really work. They work hard to help you to get well and to get to the bottom of your issues, whatever you're there to overcome. And you know, it was pretty cool. So I just wanted to say that about it. If you are struggling with a disease or a mental illness or multiple chemical, multiple chemical sensitivity, something really horrible, they really know how to get to the root of it. So anyway, whatever it's worth, I thought I would throw it out. So, um, well, that's great. When when did you go, honey, to the conference? Because we just found out about it, and they have it all the well, time. Um, I think it was about 2007 that I went. Okay. Henry Henry was still alive at that time. A more excellent yeah. way. That's just the book that he's he's famous for. It's a big old fat book about you know mm -hmm. two inches thick and really big. Um, yes, he really. He's got so many good courses. I, I've got them all. If anybody wants to, you know, yeah. borrow some from, be glad to share them. I and just ordered it on Amazon. Yeah, I just ordered it, honey, on Amazon, that one, because okay. it goes into a little more jet. Yeah. yeah. You know, honey, yeah. thank you, Angela. I had no idea. But, you know, the mind, body, and spirit are all connected. There's no doubt about it. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Um, I was going to say, my youngest brother has brain cancer, and he's had it for some time, which is really sad. Uh -huh. But either his name is Warren, but my brother Warren is the type of person that he holds anger and bitterness and resentment. Uh, uh -huh. He's been not once but twice. He's been divorced twice. And, you know, I've always said I can only handle my brother for a short time. He's like a... A woman with PMS, you know, walking on eggshells, she just, 
never know what you can say or what you can't say without him going ballistic on you, you know? And it's, it's so unstable. And the thing is about him is, is that he keeps score of everything. You know, he does not, not know how to forgive. He does not know how to forgive. And he does not look at himself in the mirror and ask himself, well, what is my part in the failure of this marriage or the failure with my sister or the failure with my only daughter or whatever? It's everybody else's fault. Well, that's his pride. See, that's his pride. That's his ego. You know, I mean, the bottom of it might really be that he thinks that he, that somehow, some way, it was pretty slow about him. Like way of being weak or, or loser or there's always a, like a rip cause that you're afraid to to be so vulnerable and and yeah. you know sometimes it goes deeper that we don't understand and, and somehow truthfully blames himself. I mean it gets complicated. You yeah, know yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. And especially yeah. for men, yeah. it's very yeah. difficult for you to be humble. It is. It's very difficult. Their egos get to be very strong. But, you know, my, my friend was saying, oh, my gosh, this conference was so powerful. And, oh, yeah. you know, we, we just really want to be able to educate people and help them because they're certainly not living their best optimal life God had created for them when, you know, they've got all these issues that are going on, you know? I, I know. It's, it's so true. true. I really appreciate it. I had no idea you went to the conference. My friend, she said it's every it's every month, and she says, uh, you know, it's it is expensive. I'm not quite sure of the amount, but she said they do have um, I don't know if they're stipends or whatever. But anyway, she said it's a whole week long, and then there was it was called Be in Health, and then there was yeah. a, a conference right after. Did you take both conferences, and Well, there's no. I took the first one, and then there's there's for your life, um, and then there's another. One after, I might have a little bit long, but they have one so that, that what you're doing is you're maintaining what you learned because you know how that is. You go to a conference and um, you start to get a handle on it and, and yeah. really get the hang of it. And then all of a sudden, then you're, you're back in the world again. So they have you come back to follow it up and, and, and boy, they go really, really strong after that. And they, then pretty much you got it. I, yeah. I think going back is really, really key because, you know, trying to get a handle on how these demons work and they work together in groups, you know, like, um, mm-hmm. like you know, like one of them he taught us is that, like, when you have, um, it, the Bible talks about, okay, it's not anything really new, but when you really get it, but that when you have resentment, then yeah. that turns into hate and, and, then, and that turns into bitterness when now you've got a whole mm-hmm. new set of demons that are oh, really, yeah. really hard to stop. And then that then turns into like murderous thoughts or at least character murder. And then you've really, you've got your, you know, so each, each step you're getting yourself in a, in a big fat, you know, mess. And, you know, even these women who have got the um, multiple chemical sensitivity, you want to know how they got it? They got it yeah. through a deep, deep resentment business because like the one woman, in fact, she is both, she speaks there because she's free. Uh, all those people that speak there are free. And wow. so this one woman, happened to her was her brothers were just so hateful to her. She's younger than them. And so they put a bag over her head and pushed her down the stairs, all the way down the bottom. Mm-hmm. And she got hurt. But she was so bitter and frightened, so deeply frightened. Um, and that she, that's one where she got all this from because she was so deeply hateful towards them mm-hmm. for doing that to her and scaring the crap mm-hmm. out of her that she got mm-hmm. all those demons. And that's how she could not even go out of her house anymore at all mm-hmm. and so it was just kind of a matter of letting all those fears go and forgiving and willing to do the work and if they were free i mean every one of them henry would help them get and um he was an amazing guy dan and i met yeah. him and he, he talked to dan and he really was really impressed with dan that he was a, a rare jehovah's witness that he'd ever met that, that got out and that would show up at one of his conferences because mm-hmm. they are too yeah. afraid to go to something like that because it's against everything they've ever believed in, you know, and, and they yeah. don't, they don't, what, and he was so excited to meet Dan and he couldn't say enough about, you know, him having gotten out of the witnesses. So he said, you keep in touch with me, Dan. And we did, we did, but um, oh. he, he did, he did die by accident. But oh, anyway, I thought else too. Every year they would send me a postcard and every year I couldn't wait to get it for Christmas so that I could yeah. see how they looked 
because every year they got younger. I kid you wow. not. And I wow. And so, you know, like with joy comes youth. And they were right. getting their youth in every which way. And That's I just was amazing. amazed yeah. by these people. And it was, so, it was such a God-ordered facility. And you could just feel the presence of, of God and the organization of it. It was this unmistakable God. And, um, yeah, that guy was amazing. So, anyway. Well, that was, you know, yeah, I, no, and it's all good. I was going to say, from what I read of his of his book, he was saying that um, it comes down to three avenues. People's separation from God, where the yeah. issues start. Separation from God separation from family and friends or separation from yourself. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I thought that was very, very powerful, you know, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So that self one is such a big deal. I mean, you're right. Separation from God, no doubt about it. All the witnesses have that problem uh, worldwide too, that I grew up in same exact thing. Um, yeah. But that separation from self, you know, because of the way that we were treated, we, we already disconnected ourselves because we were taught we're good for nothing slaves and what you're doing, you ought to have been doing, you're a piece of crap. And you don't know to anything. Especially the women. Especially the women. So we just, we down on ourselves and then, and then everything becomes our fault. Right. And so that's when we, he's unloving, he called him, they always call him unloving, the unloving spirit because it's the one that says, mm -hmm. you know, you're just a, Crap and you know you don't it's so unloving it's always telling you you're not good enough the unloving spirit always telling you're not good enough you're good for nothing whatever it is about you're just a piece of crap and that is really really a one we have to fight hard to not, uh, mm -hmm. allow in our our lives we have to turn keep surrendering to god keep surrendering to god over and over and over and and realize that we're dealing with something that's talking in our heads and right. telling us this crap that is not us and it really makes it clear what we're dealing with so that you can know that, you know, what's running in your head, you need to be aware of it because it's not you, but it's a very mean, unloving, trying to tell you you're nothing and, and you re really got to realize it. If you realize it, awareness is key. And then you can begin to say, you know, you know what, I'm not listening to you right now. You know, I know that that's not true. And, you know, you start having another talk that you do with yourself whenever you hear them say that. And right. because it's always thing and running in our heads so anyway that's just really super simplifying i suppose but um i really did learn a lot from from that guy and anyway for whatever that's worth well, well good and i i'm just gonna say it's all good and i really appreciate your input what i was gonna say angela is that you know god says to love your neighbor as yourself right remember that mm -hmm. love as yourself well we know that scripture but you know watchtower and i'm sure the Worldwide Church of God the same way. They never emphasize that. Well, how are you going to how are you going to really be effective in loving other people? Now we're not talking about you know kissing yourself in the mirror and that you're full of pride and all that. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about someone who's narcissistic personality. We're talking about a healthy love, a healthy love for yourself. If you don't love yourself in a very healthy way. How are you going to be able to have healthy relationships? How are you going to be able to love your husband or your wife? How are you going to be able to love your children? How are you going to be able to love other people? You can't because you don't even love yourself. And it all starts from yourself. God even tells us that. But when you have right. these cults, when you have these cults that twist the scriptures, okay, they twist the scriptures. And I'll also say this again, like I have before. John Ramirez was a, a high priest, third high priest in the whole entire world under uh, Satan's kingdom of darkness for 25 years. I met John. John, when I met John, it was, and I read all his books, John Ramirez. Uh, his mom was a JW for eight years. Uh, what fascinated me about John, well, first of all, he, he was scary with his background, okay? That, that's no joke. But he's he's a genuine Christian today, okay? The guy's the real deal. And John has said um, that basically you do not want to live near any kingdom halls. He's, you can watch him. You can, you, 
join him on Facebook Live and get into his inner circle. He opens it up uh, periodically. But anyway, you can talk to him one-on-one with a whole bunch of other people online. But John, John's very loving. He's very kind. You don't need to be afraid of him today. But the point I'm trying to make here is that he talks about do not live near any king malls. Okay, now why would Job, who had been involved with the kingdom of darkness for 25 years, tell you that? Why? Why would he tell you that? Because he knows how demonic the organization is. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say. Yeah, the other thing. That maybe oh, yeah. there might be energy, energy and demons around the the, the church. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And the uh, the other thing, he has a book that's called Armed and Dangerous. Okay, on page sixty four, it's really easy to remember. I was sixty four when I bought that book, and I think of the Beatles song when I'm sixty four. Okay, so it's on page sixty four. Has a book called Armed and Dangerous. You can get it on Amazon. Friends, you need to really listen to what I have to tell you. He talks about how Satan uses 21 different avenues to deceive people. 21 is a very occultic number. Hmm. And on that list, what about on page 64 of Armed and Dangerous, John Ramirez's book, he talks about, excuse me, he lists the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's got the Mormons, the JWs, the Shintoists, the New Age, Santeria, Palo Mayombe, which he was involved in those two. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are definitely listed in there from John Ramirez, who was a son of Satan, the devil, okay? The high priest. You know, you've got the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness. Okay, and John was number three in the world. And he always said Satan really loved John. There were two others. There was one that's in Cuba. He was number one high priest. The other one was in the Dominican Republic. And John was in um, uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from John. John's a very loving person. So the way I look at it is that this is somebody, this is how I look at it. This is like somebody who would be Satan, the devil, on the earth. Okay, he could also project, could do everything else. He was an assassin, assassinationist for Satan, the devil. Yeah, he, was, he, was, he was, he was, he was, there's no joke about that. And now he's the tall, beautiful man. He says, my life was like Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. I thought I was doing the because they hated Christians. I thought they were, you know, the wrong side of, of the track and his whole testimony will blow your mind away. <clears throat> but anyway, the point I'm trying to make is we're just trying to help people in a very loving way to realize, you know, you can't stick your head in the sand and expect these issues that are going on in your life to go away. You have to face them face to face and you've got to get to the root problem. And anger and bitterness and fear are some of the big ones. And you've mentioned that, Angela, and I really appreciate that, you know? Yeah, you know, and fear is not an easy one for all of us to get over. There's so many kinds of fear. I remember Henry Wright talked about that, how many different kind of fears. He had a, a whole, I don't know, I feel like it was three sheets full of different fears. And one of our assignments, one of the nights, was, I, I went through a whole week. And yeah. you have to circle which which kind of fear that you have. And I'm not yeah. kidding you. It was some crazy amount of different ones. It, yeah. They're a representative of, of um, I, I hate to say it, I don't want to make everybody feel like demon, demon, demons everywhere, but every single one of those kind of fears are like, mostly they're all demons. Fear, mm-hmm. fear of this, fear, every kind of fear that you can imagine unto mankind. And that's a lot of different things. So we have a lot of different things to overcome. And yeah. when they run a family on top of it, then you've got DNA, you know, and bread in your bro- your bones, your very DNA. And it's it's a lot to overcome and uproot and, and, and allow God to uproot out of us. But it can be done. Awareness is key. And I think that's what he was so good at was that awareness issue. Yeah. So well, one thing, you know, one thing is there are demons that come through the, the, the bloodline, through the ancestral bloodline. They're known as familiar spirits. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people are not aware of that. So no. rich and been involved in that, but you know, nobody nobody wants to be in any kind of bondage, right? And my heart goes yeah. out to people like who had been involved in your religion, Angela, or the JWs, or the Mormons. I have a family member; they're Mormons, right? you know, but they're they're in bondage. Sure, they're or Scientologists or whatever. You know, uh, these religions just want absolute manipulation and control of people's lives. So people are fear based, and yet you know the scriptures say, within Second Timothy one seven, that God didn't give us a spirit of fear; He gave us power, love, and a sound mind. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he said three hundred sixty five times, "Do not be afraid." So yeah. why do you have an organization like Watchtower or or Church of God? You know, and that's all they do is instill fear. You know. Over and over and over again. Oh my gosh, if you lose the organization, you're going to die at Armageddon. You can't go. Yeah. No, no, no. But you know, I have to tell you, when you really look at this, it, it's a bunch of lies. I mean, it really is. It's not about belonging to a religion. It's not. It's just having a relationship with Jesus Christ and reading his word and living a Christian life. It's that simple. But, you know, they have given them so much bondage. Uh, you know, it is very scary to leave the organization. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you know, you get older and you get wiser. And that's why Rich and I are on this show and, and other people, too. Because we genuinely love each and every one of you. Even though we might not have ever met you, we genuinely love you. I mean, and who wants to be in bondage? You know, God didn't create you to be in bondage. Not at all. Not at all. But the thing is, this is one thing John taught me, okay? It comes back to John because I learned so many wonderful things about John from him. John said, you know, if Satan, this is how Satan operates. If he can take something, hold on, I'm getting that tickle. Hold on. (laughs) If he can take something and twist it as far as God's character is concerned, then he has he has managed what his assignment was to do. In other words, if he can convince you that, you know, God wants you to be so afraid of Armageddon or the end of the system is coming, or you know, you're gonna you're gonna die if you leave this organization. If he can get you to believe that, which is twisting God's character, well, how is it twisting God's character? Because God is all about love. He's not about fear. He's not about fear. That's the way he's not stating up right. And right. so if you believe that lie, if you believe that lie that, oh my God, if I leave the Jehovah's Witnesses, God's going to destroy me. That's a huge one, right? You're going to stay yeah. in bondage to that organization. But that is not who God is. Okay? No. Jesus doesn't cross for each and every one of you. And because he loves you very much, and not only that, but the thing is, is that he said it is finished. There's nothing you can do. I've paid the price for everybody's sin. I have. So the witnesses are tormented with fear, tormented. And there's nothing, there's nothing happy about being in torment. There's no freedom. There's no freedom in being tormented. And we're just really trying to help people to realize that, you know, these truths of of God's word and how these cults work. You know, (laughs) they're using you as a little puppet so they can manipulate and control your life. And all they want to do is, you know, collect your money from your bank account. That's all they want. They don't really love you. And it's still that fear. Because, you know what, that whole scripture that you said just a bit ago, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. He has not given that to us. He's given right. us a, a, a spirit of power. A spirit of power. Right. Power. Power of what? Power over what? Power. Really? God's given us power? We don't, it, it, they don't want us to know that. They do not want us to know that God has given us a spirit of power and of right. love. 
a spirit of love and a spirit of a sound mind, they don't want to know that. Then we would somehow figure them out and what they're up to and what they're doing. And so we don't ever look what kind of power God's given us and how we can use it and utilize it and how that we can have a sound mind and how we, we appropriate that spirit in our lives and, and love and, and how to, you know, and, and get, be able to increase in love and how do you, the process of, of increasing in love and how do we do that? They don't teach us any of that. Because they want to stay in here. So I think it's interesting that Maris, you know, knew because he was so heavily involved in the satanic world that these churches were directly related to um, Satan and his organization um, of controlling people. And so that's a big dead giveaway, don't you think so? It's like if, if he knew that, having priests in the Satan's organization, that these churches were the ones who were, you know, manipulating people in, in the arena of fear because that's how you control people. And and right. Jehovah's Witnesses was one of them. Surely Worldwide was too. Hello, we don't want to have any part of it at all. Right. Not at right. all. And we would run and be glad that we that we could and just be glad to leave it behind and say, I'm done with that. I am moving on. And just put it behind us and just, you know, Pick up the piece, let God help us pick up the pieces and dust ourselves off and move on. Even if we're, you know, 80 years old, there's still a lot of life to live, you know, and still a lot to still breathe. So. Well, and you just said he came to set the captives free. But, you know, when you're in that organization, there's a lot of scriptures they don't share. They cherry pick they certain ones and, the, and others yeah. that are there. They don't, they don't teach. So it's really, really sad. They they do it intentionally to deceive people, but they're going to have a lot of blood guilt on their hands because there's a lot of good, good people that are inside, and they're just really misled. And, you know, one thing that I learned years ago, I started listening to the show. I remember Rich had said, you know, we have invited the governing body members to come on here numerous times onto the oh, show. What? You know? None of them ever taken up our invitation. That's number one. And I was I was a new listener. It was in October 2015. The other thing he said, because I, I was scared to comment. The other thing he said is, uh, yeah, so the other thing he said is that if we are saying anything that is untrue, you can be sure Watchtower would have sued us. You would have been absolutely sure. But you know what? Watchtower has never sued us. And why is that? Because we're speaking the truth. Now, when somebody is really speaking the truth, they know they're on solid ground. It's the people who are lying and deceiving people that are shaky. They're on shaky ground. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. yeah. this, I mean, Rick, Rick and Rich have had this show for almost 20 years, and yet not one body member has come on the show and said, well, this is you know how we disagree or whatever. No, because they know they're not teaching the truth, and they know it's only a corporation in the disguise of a religion. That's what it is, people. Wait yeah, up. Too. That works. Wait. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a freaking publishing company. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Wow. Well, wow, they were that forever and ever. Now they're just watchtower.org, but that's what they, they were. That's what they've always been. So yeah. that's not... It's not even any kind of a service to God. It's just a publishing company. Uh, well, and pretty yes, that's, that's the point. That, that's the point, Angela. There's so many genuine people in there. They think, oh, well, we really want to serve Jehovah, and this is the way we do it. No, it's this is a man-made organization. Yeah. And it has roots in with the occult, with the Freemasons. In fact, uh, there's a Freemason. You know, they're all over the place, and there's one here in town. And I said to Rich, look at their look at their sign, uh, Freemasons. It's blue and white. I said it's just like Watchtower. And I said it's they're tied in with the occult. Listen to Bob Larson sometime. The number one yeah. exorcist in the world. And he talks about yeah. how demonic Freemasonry is. Well, Watchtower is connected with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the yeah. essence? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. But you know, once you know the truth, then you really have to ask yourself. You know, how do I leave this organization? Because, you know, life life is beautiful. It's not as scary to get out. And um, 
you know, God wants you to have the best abundant life you can possibly have, but you're not going to have it in a, in an organization like this or Worldwide Church of God or anything like that where you're in bondage. No. You, mm-hmm. You're not? No, no. no. And, you know, me and Dan, we've been in a lot of Mormon homes because we live in Idaho. And it, they're in the same bondage, trust me. It's just as bad. It's just a little different. But I'm yeah. telling you, those wives are miserable, miserable oh. wives. And yeah. they're just uh, stressed and they're super intelligent. And they're just washed down to nothingness. And I just, it breaks my heart. The same kind of crap that's involved in, in that search, too. No doubt in my mind whatsoever, it's very oppressive. And uh, those women are scared to death of the prophet, so they always have a, a new prophet on, on hand all the time. They're so afraid of what the kind of eat is going to put down upon them and make things miserable for them, and so definitely yeah. afraid of the new prophet whenever the new one comes in. And they, they just have so many fears. It's not any different. You know, so it's like yeah. John Ramirez again, saying that these different religions are, are run by six. Or, you know, yeah, I believe it with all my heart now. I really do. 21 of them, Angie. There's 21. 21. 21. The very religions that are, yeah, Satan uses today to deceive people. Yeah, and sure it's, not, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And then with yeah. Watchtower, you know, Rich and I came out of Catholicism. And then we became witnesses. And, you know, when you look back at it, it's really interesting. I mean, people are looking for different things to get involved with the witnesses. I was looking for love and family and belonging. That's, that was my, those were my needs. But the thing is, is that, you know, when I was a Catholic, I remember my dad was very Catholic. And even if we were on vacation, oh, my goodness, my dad had to make sure we went to Catholic church, even on vacation. What? Wow. And so we'd go to, you know, confession. And it was like, boy, this is sort of creepy. You know, you're talking to a man inside a box and you're saying your, your sins, you know. I was little. You're trying to make up, a, you know, what what's, what is a sin? What the, you know, I was trying to make it up. You know, you're only a little kid. Anyway, and then when you become a witness, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, if you spin, now you're supposed to, because when I came into the organization, it was the time when the Elvis arrangement had come in, like 72. It was right there when it had just changed into the elder arrangement. And it was like, well, if you have a sin, you need to go to the elders. And yet, you know, when you look at it, it's it's no different than confessing like to a, to a priest, okay? The, the bottom line is, you know, you just have to ask for forgiveness, you know, to God. That's all. You don't have to go to anybody. I mean, but they have everybody convinced that, oh, my goodness, you make a mistake. You know, we're going to correct you in a loving way. No, that's a big lie right there. Okay. I've talked about that. I've talked about that on the show. And I had an elder tell me, he says, you know, Connie, he says, the average j thinks that when they go to a judicial committee meeting, that they're going to explain their situation and the elders are going to listen and be very loving and kind. He says, no, wrong. And, I, and he had been an elder for many years and had been in the organization many years. And his name was Bob Gray. He's a friend of Rich's and, and Rick. And I said, well, how does it work? And he said, when you go to the judicial committee meeting, those elders have already made up their mind how they're going to make the decision on you before you even walked in. Oh, boy. Oh boy! Wow! Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's all about legalism and all these rules and regulations and you know if Jesus men controlling and, men about men controlling Jesus, men. Yes, it's men controlling men. Yeah. And Jesus even said, "He said, see those Pharisees over there? Yeah, they're so pompous. They got the beautiful garments and they're in the town squares and." You know, they have to have a huge display of themselves and they're praying like, oh, they're sanctimonious and look at us. Aren't we holier than thou or better than you? And he said, you know, they're like vipers. He said, don't even, when they say one thing, but then they don't even act it out. They're hypocrites. So don't even follow them. Well, it's Sam. Same way. Same way. Yeah. You're, you're, 
and we can find up stories about that, you know, you see the elders more. I'm not saying all the elders, okay? I'm not. But, you know, you see some elders at the Kingdom Hall were great brothers. Others were not. Some of them are on a real power trip. And the thing is, Rich can tell you, oh, my gosh, when they get out and, you know, after working together and having a few drinks, oh, boy, you get to you let their hair down. You really get to see them for who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Rich. Yeah. And confidentiality, there's no confidentiality. You know, mm -hmm. they're telling them they're telling their wives who's going to be disfellowshipped and what's for it. Those elderettes are some of the worst gossipers ever. Horrible. Yeah, Almost like they couldn't wait to figure out somebody else they can just mm -hmm. to exert their power over everybody. You know, it's kind of crazy. They don't, have any life. they don't have any kind of life except to gossip and talk about everyone else's business. They're very small. Yeah, okay. or, or make fun of your, your number one speech or whatever you call those speeches you guys have to Give, you know, you know, yeah. sort of, you know, make fun of them, cut you down, just again, exert control and power over you, make you feel less than just because they can. Something else. Well, men, men, believe men. Well, I'll say when we get over that, you guys, we'll be, we'll be exerting that power that God, he said, he's given us the spirit of power. You know, in a situation I was really scared of, and Dan was out of town, and I had to deal with something that was going on, and, and I was scared. And so yeah. I said, Lord, I said, um, you know, Lord, I need you to give you my your power. Give me now your power, your authority. Put yeah. it upon me so I can handle this situation. And, you know, it was the most amazing thing that happened. First of all, the person was very scared of me all of a sudden. And, mm -hmm. um, and again, God gave me a really powerful voice that spoke and said, I don't, hear, I don't hear you doing blah, blah, you know, whatever it was I said. I don't hear you doing, I can't hear anything going on up there. I told you that you need to, you know, right now, and, you know, it's like authority that came on yeah. me real strong. And I, was, I had no fear. And that person, you know, obviously have demons on him at the time. And, yeah. um, boy, they, they knew right now that I had power on me. And they just backed up, like, right away before I even said a word. And just, like, knew that, that, that they were powerless all of a sudden. That normally oh, yeah. that person, a big, huge, scary, de demonic power of of um, control over, like really scary, and that's why I was scared. But anyway, really? man, just that like looking, look at happened. Yeah, and I well, you know what that that was a non problem because the God showed up, man. Woo. Yes, that's an excellent point, uh, Angela. I was going to say, you know, when it comes to power and control. Okay, that's the witchcraft spirit. That's what it is. Power and control is witchcraft. Yeah. So the whole organization is based on the spirit. When I say spirit, I'm talking about a demonic spirit of witchcraft. Okay, but JWs don't know that. Okay, that's number one. <laughs> yeah, number two, I learned this from John. He says, let me tell you something. He says, most Christians today, he said, he said they're so weak. Yeah, they're like cotton oh, kids. They're so weak. Yeah. They don't even they don't even know who they are with with God's power and his love and his authority no, and Jesus kind of, but he said kind of I don't like that you said it that way, but whatever, you know, I think that we should say more like don't accuse, just simply say we need to as Christians learn how to use the authority that's been given to us. We have not no, been taught the Learn. He does say that. He does say that. But I just wanted to finish my thought. So the thing is, is that what he said is that when you are a genuine Christian and you know who you are and whose you are, okay, as a genuine Christian and the power of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, when you know who you really are as a genuine Christian, he said the demons are absolutely terrified of you. Because you are a spiritual warrior, and you really know who you are and whose you are. That's that's the point, yeah. honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, because like even in that incident I was telling you about, the, mm -hmm. the the demon world was made aware of that part that was put upon me at that moment before I even knew anything. I, I didn't realize what it. I just. And all of a sudden, that person is deathly afraid of me. As if, if there are demons that were afraid of me, 
Because right. suddenly, uh, as a big right. conflict on me. Wow. Yeah, you, you, know? yeah. you took your authority that Christ gave you. Mm -hmm. See, when it's, when it's, you don't even know their authority. Uh -huh. Because if you have it, the organization does not have God's Holy Spirit. The organization is the next. Yeah. There's many below. Yeah. Yeah, go so, ahead. Thank you, Angela. That was you. Hey, hey JC. Yeah. Hi, this is Hey, honey, how you doing? I'm doing well. I know you're a little sick. I hope you're feeling a little better. Thank you, honey. I'm sure Dick's taking good care of you. That's right. <laughs> um, I was a little in and out of the show tonight, but it was talking about uh, loneliness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that. Today, for the first part, um, especially from somebody that was in the organization, today, when it was my, uh, even though I'm not a witness anymore, but I still, you know, love all the friends and stuff. So I, I went today with my, with my mother to go visit an old sister, and she's 98 years old now, and she lives down the street in a convalescent home, and, um, or like a senior care home. And we went to go visit her, and I've known her all my life. I mean, I'm 40 now. I've known her since I was five. And she's 98 now. And when I knew her since I was five years old, she's always been a pioneer up until she was in her 80s. And she couldn't do it anymore. And I have been dying probably about over 20 years ago. But I've known her for such a long time. I remember uh, when I was 14, 15, when I used to auxiliary pioneer, I remember going out w with her in street work and I used to mow her lawn and do stuff around her house. But I went to visit her today and it, it's just so sad to see how lonely she is and how nobody, she doesn't have really much family, you know, that takes much care of her, but I came to find out that only my mother and two other sisters are the only ones that go visit her. But when I went to go visit her today, it was she was so glad to see me, and it really melted my heart. I felt so bad, like I kind of lost contact with her and stuff for the last while, but I really want to make it a point to go see her. But I just, I've seen this time and time again, you know, through the years of where People were sort of watched her for so long, and where I mean, I was asking my mom, there's no brothers that go and visit her, or no servants, or anything. Nobody goes and prays over her, or anything. And it's just, you no, know, nothing. And it's just so sad. So I'm really going to make it a point to go because it's not, she, they moved her to a, a place that's not even that far from my house, just a couple blocks away. So I'm just going to make it a point to go see her a few times a week and just pray for her and just read her some scriptures. Like I was thinking, like reading her the book of Romans and Hebrews, because it's just so sad. She had nothing around her. She's sitting in a wheelchair. She didn't even have a Bible near her. There was just watchtowers and other stuff all around her. Even when we're leaving, you know, my mom still goes there a few times a week. And this lady, she's 98. She still tries to write letters and do stuff for the organization. It's just so sad. And I know she has a lot of faith and she believes in it. Because even when we're leaving, there was two nurses that came in there. And they were going to help to put her into bed. When we were leaving, she was already asking him because she knows there's the memorial tomorrow and she was asking him what, what they were doing tomorrow because one of the sisters that goes to visit her is actually going to go there after her memorial because she has an early one and she's going to go, you know, do the, put it on Zoom for that sister so she can uh, tune into the memorial. But it's just, you know, she was even inviting these two nurses still to 
join her tomorrow in her room, you know, to watch this memorial on Zoom. And it's, it's heartwarming, but it's sad at the same time. There's nobody there that checks on these people. I mean, I go to a non-denominational church and we, they have a homeless ministry. They have one that makes sure to take care of, check on people that are in the hospitals. And there's also one for the elderly people to, you know, for us to check on them and their, if they're in senior living homes or just to check on them in their house, just to make sure if they need help and stuff. But to see that they, that this, it, it was just so sad to see her so lonely, you know, by herself. So I, I've seen that, you know, time and time again through the years of where people serve this organization so much and they just get dumped off and God knows what happens to these people. It's happened to a lot of people that have left Bethel or got, not left, but got, you know, dismissed from Bethel and stuff that served their, their whole life and stuff. and. And that's not even counting the rank and file witness that person that took a you know a part time job just to pioneer the whole life. And now they're old and they're either in a home or they're living in somebody's basement, and it's just really sad. And I saw that for the first time today. So the only thing I can do is just go by there to see her, and I'm not even a witness anymore. But she still means so much to me because. Even though I'm not a witness, I still, you know, consider her a sister, and she was always very kind to me my whole life. And I love her, you know? Yeah. But it really hurts to see her, like a, a lot of other uh, older witnesses that I've seen through, you know, the decades, that the same thing has happened to them, and then they just are forgotten. Well, I'm you said it well. And you have a very good heart. Thank you for coming on. You know, I'll just end with that. I'm sorry, sister, did you, does someone want to comment? Oh, I just want to say thank you so much for that. Because, you know, it reminds us to be doing our job, you know, because um, that's what true undefiled religion is, visiting the orphans and the widows and those that are downtrodden and, and crushed. And, and they've been forgotten. It's like our wounded, you know, uh, our veterans. You know, we, we need to make sure not to forget those who are, are, are in that position. That's what Jesus said. He came to come and set free and to help, and that's our job as pre pure and wild religion. So anyway, good job, brother, and I hope that you keep that up, and thanks for being a exa good example to all the rest of us. Thank you. Yeah, I second that emotion big time. You know, the Watchtower is absolutely infamous for the way they treat people. I mean, you stop and think about it. You are a person that goes to Bethel in New York. I know they moved it substate now, but you, you go to Brooklyn and you're 17 years old, you just out of high school, and your mom and dad are uh, servants or elders, and oh, you've got to go to, you know, go to Bethel. And so you go to Bethel, spend 40 years there, right? And then they dismiss you. Well, your parents are gone. They left their house or the watch tower. You know, so you don't know it. You don't have any inheritance. You can't collect social security. You should never work. Uh, you took a, a, a bottle of poverty. You have, you're an old woman. You can't work. What are you going to do? You're going to go on welfare. That's all that's left. And I can share that welfare pie with the illegal aliens that are coming into this country. 10 to 20 million. I don't know. Numbers change all the time. But the Watchtower does not care. You would think that they would love these Jehovah's Witnesses that worked for 30, 40, sometimes 50 years in Brooklyn, printing magazines and books and whatever they do there. You think that, yeah, there'd be some kind of a retirement plan for them? Absolutely no. And they don't care. And when they sold their when they sold all their properties off in Brooklyn, they earned billions of dollars, not millions, with a B, billions. I heard $3 billion. I can't confirm that, but that's, that's what I heard, and that's probably accurate. Do you think they could turn around and say, listen, um, here's Bus Bearer, 
ten grand to get started, you know, to get you into an apartment complex or something. You think I could do that? Not on your life. Because they're greedy and they only care about two things money and perversions. That's what they care about. Crazy sex things and we've been hearing this for years. And now it's coming it's coming to everybody's notice. And and if we're lying, watch out, um you know, then let your attorneys. But I think we've proved I think we've proven it. And the fact that as Connie mentioned earlier, they don't come on. I mean, you would think you would think that I read elder somewhere uh, would come on six screens and and give us uh, a good tongue lashing, but they don't. They're the telling the truth. There's, there's nothing nothing phony about six screens. If we don't know, we tell you, you know, to the bank and, and try to cash it. So that's it. Anybody want to comment on being lonely in the watchtower? I just have another thought. You know what it's like? I went to this great kingdom hall. And me and my dad, we surveyed the land for the, uh, for the property that the great kingdom hall was built on. And I remember donating $1,000. This was probably in 72, 73, I think 72. And that, that was a lot of money there, a lot of money. I was all the guys making four dollars an hour, and I, I donated a thousand dollars to that kingdom hall, and I worked my tail off. It wasn't a quick build as we all know quick bills to be. It, it took months for that kingdom hall to be built, but when it was built, it was beautiful, beautiful building. Everything was done right in it. And so we had a governing body member who's one of the anointed dedicate that kingdom hall. To Jehovah's Witnesses. And we all know Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus did not die on a cross, but a torture state. Well, in C.T. Russell's time, he died on a cross, but when Rutherford came in, he died on a torture state. And J.W.'s been following that for a long time. You know what it feels like to drive back that kingdom hall? And me and Rick did, we actually pulled in the parking lot. And what do you see on the roof? A crucifix all over the place, you know. They sold that kingdom hall off that was um, dedicated to Jehovah, the God of the universe, and they sold it for money to another denominational church. Doesn't that make you feel lonely when people mention that to you? Uh, when you tell them that you're building a kingdom hall in Dragon Mass, and you know, that's where we're going to honor Jehovah and, and we're going to honor his son there too. And the son died on a torch state, come to find out. Well, we all know he didn't die on a torch state, that on a crucifix. And it's pretty good. Yeah, please. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I just wanted to say, really, really good show tonight. I've been just listening to Angel. I've been just around saying we're over in Canada. So my daughter got married today, so we're just kind of taking it easy, you know? Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We did a job at Anacortes first, which is about Washington, and then we were here for five days, and then um, and then we drove seven, 70 miles, I think, to what's the town we're in? Mission. Uh, Mission, uh, British Columbia. <clears throat> British Columbia. So... Yeah. Anyway, we're just resting, but really, really good show. And uh, yeah, yeah, Rich, it, it, it's absolutely sickening to see a hall that was dedicated to Jehovah. The brothers fell with their own hands, happily did it, worked into the night, worked all night, you know, and, the, and, and, and to see them further what they call Christianity, further, speed it up. We felt the church. For the church, outside of the organization. If, if, if anybody ever sat down and thought about that with a brain, like a witness with a brain, if you sat down and thought about it, if you, if you was out there working all night, which we did, 
putting in carpet. We used to do the carpet. I used to do the carpet with a guy. And I remember that was like in the middle of the night. We do the carpet. And the sisters are all out there cooking. And <clears throat> we're eating. And then in the morning, they set up the chairs. The guys are finishing up the cabinets. And you dedicate that thing to Jehovah. So you think about this. You can't even go into a church for something as sacred as a marriage. You cannot go into another church for a marriage or a funeral. You cannot go into another church. That's Babylon the Great, the World Empire, false religion. Yet the governing body can sell that, can sell that to Christianity, can speed up their work. Think about that. They can speed up Christianity's work. Oh, you don't have to build your own home. We built you one. The brothers built you one with sweat and money and love and intention to Jehovah, not to false religion. But that's what you say, Dick. They don't care. All they care about is money. All they care about is, you know, the almighty buck. And it's so retarded. I mean, I tell you, I left a long time ago. I left 22 years ago. But if I was in there now, I would want to grab one of those brothers and I'd say, who sold our home? I would, I would, I would find them. Who, who sold our home? Who sold this home we built? You know, my dad put a bunch of shitload of money into this home. Who sold this home? What do you mean we don't own it? What do you mean Doverty Bob sold it? And what do you mean you sold it to a marijuana clinic? Or what do you mean you sold it to a, you know, a church? And I would look him in the eye and I'd grab him by the chin and say, don't give me that bullshit now. It's just a building. That building was built with intention to the Almighty God. It was built with intention. And you just hand it over to a damn church. In fact, the same church my brother got married in that I couldn't even walk in, you blessed them with it. I mean, that's how we got to look at it. Right, Lisa? That's how we got to look at it. And, you know, not, not with closed eyes, not with stupid, shut-down brains, but you know, I was writing down a couple things as you guys were talking. Watchtower is a trauma-based organization. You know, it's run on fear. And and Connie was talking about earlier, it destroys homeostasis. If you don't have equilibrium and homeostasis, which means peace, you get sick. It's a mind-body connection, you know, because when, when fear runs into your body, I forget how many chemicals, bad chemicals, it sends down into your body and causes these trauma, you know? And, and so Watchtower are architects of fear. And we heard a, a lady call us that was on one of our shows last week. I mentioned it, I think, last week. But a lady came on and said, what was it, her mother or grandmother? She was at the Kingdom Hall. And they, they, did, a damn, they did one of those drills, one of those to-go bag drills. They set off the alarms. Now, this is the trauma now. Now, see that the trauma in the organization has increased 100 fold. Just look at the assembly. You know, abandon your shit, leave your home, you know, run for the woods, run for the woods, head for the camps. You know, um, it's, it's 100 fold since we've been in there. Think about this, guys. 100 times what we've been in there. So, this lady says she sees her grandma. They couldn't almost resuscitate her. She lost her breath. She's like, what the hell's going on? They're running out of the kingdom hall, doing a drill. You know, have you, did you have your to-go bag? And they almost couldn't resuscitate her because the trauma is so bad. And, you know, when you stay in trauma for a long time, you get PTSD. You get fibromyalgia. It's a mind-body connection. It starts to destroy your body. Fear will exactly. cripple you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. It takes over the front part of your mind. The front part of your mind, uh, I forget what it's called. Yeah. 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 And so here's what I want to say, too. I, I got to say this. You know, I, I agree with you guys. We don't use the word demons enough. You know, when I got out of there, I didn't want to hear demons again. I didn't. I didn't ever want to hear demons. They had us, demons around every corner. But you guys, you want to know what demons are? They're spirits. And you want to know what spirits are? A spirit of lying is a demon. Watchtower lies and continues to lie. That's why Jesus said, your offspring of vipers. 
He was talking to the demons within him. He told Paul, Peter, whoever, get behind me, Satan, because there were spirits in him. You know what I'm saying? And so Watchtower operates under the veil of suit and tie, under the veil of illusion, under the veil of the pretense of light, but they're lying their ass off. They lie, and then they lie again, and then they lie again. Here's what's even worse. Here's where schizophrenia, compartmentalization, and fear, homeostasis. See, Watchtower has destroyed three things in your body, and they're God-given. They told you not to think. Don't read anything outside of Watchtower. Where your mind, where your thoughts at. We have it covered in a magazine. The elders got it covered. The governing body got it covered. So they've taken your mind. They've taken your heart. And they've taken your gut. All these are GPSs. All these are inner guidance systems. All these are things that you've needed. Watchtower, because we said we will give our life over to Watchtower, we have given our temples over to Watchtower. We've given our inner temples. And Watchtower has built a temple within us of total obedience and fear. And so they run the organization by fear. And because of that, the people have disassociation, you guys have talked about, separation. They've abandoned themselves. Just think about that. God gave you a brain. God gave you a heart. Heart's treacherous and desperate. Don't trust it. Don't feel for that brother over there. They've taken away your feelings. Right? So what power has told you, Angela dealt with that disassociation in Angela. No, I did. Disassociation real bad. Because you aren't there anymore. Your guide systems are gone. Your thinking's gone, your heart's gone, your gut, all the things. You Welcome to Touch by the Mysticals of the Watchtower. In the insular world of the Jehovah's Witnesses, conformity and adherence to doctrine are paramount. For Mike Bud Sex Sniffles, navigating, and he does put the gay in navigating, his identity as a flaming homosexual Native American within this strict religious community was a constant battle between his authentic self and the expectations of his faith. Growing up in a Native American family, Sniffles felt the weight of secrecy pressing down on him, almost teabagging him. Unable to find the teachings that condemned his very existence and his love for dicks in all shapes and sizes. When rumors about his sexuality began to circulate within the congregation, Mike's worst fears were. Truth by hiring prostitutes, the elders convened a tribunal. Sounds like the governing body. He's doing a description of the governing body there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know that's why that's why Jesus said whitewashed graves, offspring of vipers, dead man's body. Mike found himself cast out of the oh, only God. world. He was talking about the spirits that have taken over those Pharisees. And so we don't think about that. And, and, and you know, those spirits that you guys mentioned earlier, what were they? Loneliness reduced to a scandalous faggotry epithet whispered in hot tones among his former brethren and former lovers he left behind. Alone and mentally and anally shattered, Mike Snipple. What a sick mind. It's got to be a watchdog for Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Dan. You know, what he has yeah. is very, very you know, inspiring and intelligent and expulsion and anal prolapse. You know, like that. It's just a one. But yeah. So, to get your name. Yeah. I just want to say, you know, you know, those dark forces that are behind Watch Hour, the reason I call them dark forces is because they continue to lie. They won't come clean. They lie. They're selling off our kingdom friends too. I call a buying self acceptance amidst a society that often rejected his very existence. I'm loved. <laughs> but you, but you know what I want to say about loneliness, guys? Go down a few here. You know why? Because Watchtower is gonna throw your ass in the street and abandon your ass. When you get out of Watchtower, you are off Watchtower Planet. They kick your ass off. They keep your family. And what, 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 the conference has been locked. 
The conference has been unlocked. That's a lot of applause. The conference has been locked. <laughs> but anyway, I just yeah. want to tell people where to play the here to you. You know, pre plan when you watch our games. Pre plan. Um, Watchtower loves the pain of seeing you out there squirming around. Every man. You know, they want, they want, it's, it's not, it's not shunning, it's abandonment. And I think what people don't know is what they don't know. When you, when you leave Watchtower, you are abandoned. You are abandoned. Your family's abandoned you. I did not believe the conference has been unlocked. I thought my mom would still love me and I thought my family would still love me. I did not realize that Watchtower was going to come. The conference has been locked. Watchtower planet. Never to return. And so when you come out of Watchtower, you've got to start making a damn plan or plan before you leave. I had a guy write me yesterday from Watchtower, and he said, I'm a PMO. And I said, take your time and plan. <laughs> he says, isn't it crazy? You've got to plan your escape from Watchtower? Don't tell anybody. Yeah, yeah. And, and don't tell anybody, but I'm like, you've got to plan your fucking escape from a religion. Plan your escape. And I said, just go slow, my friend. Take your take your time and plan and get out of there because um, you will be abandoned. You will be cut off. It's, it's going to be a hundred times more so than you think. Maybe find a community. I had I had communities I went to when I left. You know that's why I landed on my feet. I had community and I and I reached out to some people. So I had some friends to lean on that weren't going to abandon me. I had a, a spiritual community that I went to, and I, I kind of bridged over, and I wasn't, even though my family abandoned me, I had a community. And I think so many people don't realize what, they don't know what they don't know. They don't really realize when you leave, it's just like cutting a umbilical cord. You, I mean, you are, you are off, and, and, and they like it like that, and it's punishment. That's why when you come back, it's totally out of harmony with scripture. You got to remember, these are dark practitioners. These are dark practitioners. These are evil practitioners. People that lie are evil practitioners. People that have an intention to lie are evil practitioners. They're not just men doing a damn good job. They're not just men doing the best they can do. And what I would say to Watchtower is your best is not good enough. And we don't listen to you anymore. We're done listening to you. Your best is not good enough. You're not apologizing. You're not admitting. You're saying light is light, dark is dark. Think about this, guys. 75 happens, right? It happens. Never happened. What are you talking about? Who left? I mean, that's that's saying light is, that's saying what was once light, 75 was once a bright ass light, right? You were given the watchtowers and got new light. Here it is. Here it comes. And then there it went. So the light went out. And they said, no, that wasn't light. We got more light. And then the generation prophecy, then the over it. So what that does is causes a split mind. Now think about this, guys. Split mind. You have to. You have to compartmentalize. You have to shut down. Your inner GPS is going. Your bullshit meters are going. Everything's going off. Every alarm's going off. And you, you're saying, I think, I think maybe they lied. What are they talking about? New light. Um, what, what are we doing? What's going on here? Uh, we just have to, uh, well, let's go to the assembly. And let's be reprogrammed into new light. But because you gave yourself over to dark practitioners that don't give a shit about you, they're just going to feed you more bullshit, not new light, more bullshit. But what happens is when you shove down a bullshit meter within you, you start to disassociate from yourself because your bullshit meter is your anchor. Your bullshit meter is what tells you truth from falsehood. This is false. Let me give you an example. If, if you've got a bad deal, if you made a bad deal, or let's just say a plane's flying over. You go, wow, a plane's flying over. Watch how it says the plane flying over. You don't know, a plane's flying over. What would you start to do? You would start not trusting yourself. 
You say, well, maybe I didn't see a plane fly over. Or if you got a bad investment. Oh, yeah, that's a good investment. Just hang on. Well, you said it was going to come through last month. It didn't come through. Don't, don't worry. It's going to come through. Actually, it wasn't supposed to come through last month. It's supposed to come through this month. Oh, okay. I must have got it wrong. So you start disassociating and compartmentalization. And that moves into deeper and deeper psychosis, which eventually can, if because you've already compartmentalized, begins to start into schizophrenia and split personality because you're losing touch with the self that God, God gave you, God gave it built in GPS, bullshit, or whatever you want to call it, the ability to know truth from falsehood. When you stuff down what you see is true and you say, well, maybe I didn't see it. You start to separate from yourself and you don't know yourself anymore. And that's when it gets very, very dangerous. Angela was in that for a long time. And to pull, to pull her back, yeah, you know, we can all get into it. But, but for somebody to continue to practice in that way, that would be somebody that looks like light. Oh, they're just men doing the best they're doing. But they're practicing darkness. It's Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. And so that's hopefully what we can get to seeing when we've been BS enough, like that brother coming on there saying, you know, after his mother did all her work, 90 some years old, she's all by herself. A few magazines around her writing letters. That's what my dad did when he died. He started writing letters to everybody. He said, their house was burning. If your house was burning down, I want to send you a letter. I love you. And hoping he could get in Jehovah's good graces before he died, but, <clears throat> but he didn't. He died of shame. He died of shame. He had pancreatic cancer. Uh, you know, just toxic shame was what my dad lived in because he felt like he didn't raise his kids with in Jehovah's Witnesses. And then my mother died screaming, Jehovah's going to kill me. My younger brother just died saying the same thing, Jehovah's going to kill me. And uh, it's, it's, it's a train wreck, guys. It's Watchtower over a long period of time leads to mental illness. And I'll say it again. Watchtower over a long period of time will lead to mental illness, and you don't have to stay in it. There's life after watchtower. There's homeostasis. There's, there's, here's what's cool now. I know God's got my back. I know God's got my back. The watchtower, I know God's got my back. Then. I have never had that feeling in watchtower. I've always felt that God was, was you know, seek righteous, seek meekness. You might be concealed in his anger. Because he's angry, pissed off, and jealous. That's how I knew Jehovah. I couldn't even really pray to Jehovah. But I got to tell you guys, Connie and Angela and, and Dick and all the other people out here, this is life after Watchtower. It's nothing like feeling like God's got your back with your finances, your home. There's nothing like it. I, I never experienced it until I got out of it. So I chose to step all the way from these dark occultists. And the dark occultists is, is just. It, it's they don't look like darkness guys. They look like light. They wear suit and ties. They look pretty. They they they've got a nice broadcasting network. But it's what they do. One lady told Angela for years, Angela, it's not what they say, it's what they do, right, Angela? And, and Angela posted that on the refrigerator. And he said, Angela, it's not what they say, it's what they do. It's what they do. It's what they do. Actions speak louder than words. So what is Watchtower doing? as opposed to what they're saying. So that's how we start. Eventually, we start getting our thinking back. Eventually, we take our power back. Eventually, we take our minds back. And then if God, of course, rewires us, he said he rewires us and the forces actually the mind to where we have true relationship, divine union. And God is calling us all to that, to divine union, calling us back home. If we'll come home, the door is open. The door is open. All we got to do is say yes. And, and it'll help rebuild up all our frequencies, our love again. It'll help us take our cold hearts that are hardened from Watchtower. And it'll soften our hearts. And it'll make us new. And it'll make us care again for people. And it's the most beautiful thing in the world. I've seen it over and over and over again. And we have a sound mind and peace and homeostasis. And we don't have to live in that trauma. You don't have to live in that trauma of Watchtower. But anyway, guys, I've, I've probably talked to you good bit. I just wanted to throw yeah. that out tonight. It's, that's great, Dan. I was going to say um, the one thing that came to my mind was, you know, you receive that peace 
And and Jesus said, I will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Because there's the healing, right? You don't have yeah. that peace inside this organization. It doesn't matter how much you try, how much you work, how much you do. People just do not ever have that peace that surpasses all understanding. And That's God loves it. Yeah, it's very real, Rich. Because I mean, it feels uh, like overshadowing. It feels like mm -hmm. you just you don't feel the same thing as the, as the world. You don't feel all the craziness. There's an over. Would you guys call it an overshadowing? Yeah, it's a good way to present it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the whole world can be spinning out of control, but you have a peace, a peace like you're on solid ground, no matter what the storm is. You know, you're going to be absolutely fine because it's like Psalms 91. You're under the shadow of the Almighty. You're under his feathers for protection. He's a shield. He's a rock. Nothing's going to harm you. And yet, you know, that's where your peace comes in because he is your anchor. God is your anchor. Yeah. But what, I never, I yeah. Think about it. Once power just Jehovah was to be feared. I never knew about loving Jehovah. Fear him so I could get into paradise. Fear him so I, I did enough watch power. Fear him, you know. Yeah. No. But you know, and not as the world gives give I get you know that peace. It's not like the world gives peace. It's a deep Yeah, peace. she said like nothing. Yeah, nothing you've ever had. That's right. But you know, it's very interesting because it's like what John said. If he can, if Satan can take something and twist it, the character of God, right? If he can twist, meaning Satan, can twist the character of God and people believe it, then he's accomplished his goal. That's so, a great point. You know, the fear, okay? You never hear when you're a chain thank you, how it's all about God is love, you know, and Jesus died for, for you because he loved you so very much. It was a very great price to pay. Nothing of that sort. They don't emphasize that. They're always telling people, oh, you've got to be so afraid of Jehovah. He's Jehovah of armies. You know, Jehovah is so fearful. What are the other adjectives they use? But it's just they create so much fear and anxiety that, oh, my gosh, this is the God I fear. I have to be so afraid of Jehovah, you know? And that's why there is so much mental illness, Dan, like you said, in the organization. They don't emphasize anything about how God is love. He's a God of justice. He's a God that wants the very best for your life. No, no. They have everybody on high alert all the time, the PTSD, and it never stops. And, you know, unfortunately, Dan, you, you experience that with, you know, with your family and your parents which is so very really sad. I'm sure that made God cry to see how your parents yeah. ended up. Yeah, because they, they made God, they made Jehovah into a monster. I couldn't go to Jehovah and tell him anything personal or anything. All I did was, you know, it was kind of like, how would you say, what would you call that? There's a word for it. I was proactive, Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. I was always fixing my wrongs but by doing more out the door. door. If I didn't think I did what I was supposed to do or I failed Jehovah, then it would be go to an assembly, uh, play here this month, go out a few more hours, do whatever. So it, it wasn't like this loving God. It was always like trying to make up. I need to do more. I need to do, you know, it wasn't, it was just fearing that I wasn't going to make it. It wasn't this kind of work. Life might be up anyway, right? Yeah, like you're trying to earn your, it's works, it's yeah. based on works, yeah. you're trying to earn your salvation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, or make amends for my wrongdoing. They think I got the or bridges I thought was wrong, man, or maybe whatever I did. It's like, man, I can't do more. Well, right. right. That's a love relationship. That's the fear, Dan. That's the fear. That's the fear that this yeah. organization instills in people. These people are mentally not healthy. There's so much fear and no surprise that so many people have a lot of physical ailments like we were talking about earlier, fibromyalgia. You know, the list just goes on and on and on because it's like God's word says in Proverbs, as a man thinketh, he becomes. So you, you have it on your mind of constant fear 
oh my God, God's going to, you know, punish me. He's going to destroy me. You know, you know, your life is not going to be very uh, happy and your health is definitely going to, it's going to be demise. That's for sure. Well, you know, you know one thing I saw early on that was interesting? Mm -hmm. I would go to a, to a book study and I would see, you know, you know, you kind of see the mental illness creeping in, but I would look at his sister and I'd say, is that the same sister? Like I would look over at the sister and, you know, in the picture and she'd be real beautiful. And then I would look at her, you know, and I'd say, oh, her hair's falling out. You know, not that there's something wrong with someone with the hair falling out, but, but, I, but I'd say, oh, her hair's falling out. Oh, she looks rough. Oh, she looks like. And what's happening is, is guys, is like you say, how much fear can we take? Right. How much, how much stuff can we take? How much compartmentalization can we take? How much being out of homeostasis can we take before our body starts to, to break down and cripple from the inside out? So I started noticing people that were very beautiful, that were starting to look rough, that were starting to look, just starting to deteriorate their mind. When I saw my brother, my brother Doug, he's a presiding overseer to this day. He was talking like slow. You know, he was like this. How are you doing, Danny? You know, and my uncles were talking slow and they were splunched over. This was at my brother's funeral on Skype. And they were hunched over and they were leaning on the table and they said they'd been very sick. All of them had been very sick. And I was like, um, you know what, guys? I felt sorry for them. It wasn't yeah. like I was mad at them. I was like, Look what's, look what's happening here. They don't even know it. They don't even know it that these are dark practitioners. Go ahead. Exactly. No, you're right, Dan. You're absolutely right. They believe the lie to say that there is yeah. an angel. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have to take every now and then. I just want to say this for anybody who's listening. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, what's going to happen is God's going to tap you on the shoulder. And say, do you want to come out of there? I got an opening. There's an opening. You, we, we've made an opening. Maybe your soul was crushed. Maybe you had something happen. You, you were deceived. Your elders are pedophiles. Something happened. Mm -hmm. God tapped you right down. Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. Jesus, I don't care. And says, want to come out? You want to come out? You can come out. And I did it. I said yes. I, and I said to them, where are we going? Where are we going? And you feel like, you know, you're going into the desert. Like, where, where am I going? It's like, I have no idea. This was my home. This was my daddy. These were my parents. These are my uncles. These are my, the governing bodies and the authority my whole life. Where do I go? I'm going to tell you where you're going to go. You're going to lose your infrastructure. You're going to be thrown off planet watch tower. You're going to have a parachute. God's, God's got you all equipped, and he's going to catch you. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. All I had to say, all I want you guys to say is yes. Just say yes. I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to go. I need some help. I need a parachute. I, I need somebody to catch me. And God's waiting. He's waiting for you to come home. He's waiting for us to come home. And, you know, I decided I want to come home. I don't want this anymore. I don't want to be told by these men that don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. I don't want to be ruled by eight men who lie and who can't admit they're liars. I don't want to be ruled by eight men who sold their soul for soup. They don't care about truth. And I'm finding out, sorry to say, I'm really sorry to say this. A lot of witnesses don't care about truth. But I met those witnesses a week ago at Park, these sisters. I don't care. I was happy to care. It's not the best they can. How about generating? I'm like, well, that's true. You're talking about not caring. So there's got to come a point at some point where you want truth over falsehood. There's got to come a point. Usually, it's you lose all your money. You make a bad investment. Right. You know. Right. You make a bad investment, and you go, they screwed me. That's when you usually feel. Or when you get sideways with the brothers or somebody body, or you disagree with them. Then all help to lose. So, yes. but I got to tell you though, Angela found out, I can't found out there is a God in the universe. And, and we're children of God. We're 
children. We've just been misled. We've just been, in the, like in a lot of religions, you can be misled. There's a lot of falsehoods out there. Everyone's got a pretty good story. But when the story proves false, that's when we've got to come out of denial. We've got to say, that's false. That's bullshit. I, no, that's bullshit. And when we do, then we go, oh, now what? Now you're in trouble. You're not really in trouble. You just think you are. Because you will be abandoned by Watchtower. You will be let out. But for me, it was fast. I had friends that said, Dan, I'll never leave you. I'm with you forever. I found out when I left that God had not left me. I still have my job. I like, Jehovah, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. God's there. Call him Jehovah, whatever you want. But I was like, God was still here. But Anne was going to come over this mountain and grab me out of my car. And there was no hand that came over and grabbed me out. I was scared shitless. And Angela said she had the same experience. But it was like every day that went by, I was like, you're still feeding me, God. You're still making sure I got work. You're still there. You protect me to live. Mm -hmm. The biggest surprise you're going to realize when you leave Watchtower is God didn't abandon you. She just right. left crazy, eight crazy men who've been lying and continue to lie and will continue to lie until, and the same with Angela. Angela didn't think she would get another cup of coffee. She said, this is, this is my last cup of Starbucks coffee. This is before she met me. Yeah. And she's like, this is it. I'm going to be homeless. And that's what you think would come out of Watchtower. You really do. You think, where am I going to go? My family's abandoned me. What am I going to do? Yeah. Never left and never will. And, and at first, it's a shock and awe. It is shock and awe. Watchtower wants to be shock and awe. That's why they throw you out in your head and cut off your family. Total abandonment. Immediate abandonment. Immediate, you don't, know, you know, talk to them. And then, um, and then you're out there on your own, and everything that goes by, you go, I'm not dead yet. I mean, you really think you're going to be dead. You're going to be going back to the mire. You're going to be crushed under Jehovah's feet. You know, you're back with the pigs of the world. You chose Satan over Jehovah. You have all this stuff running to your head, and now you start thinking, man, God, you're pretty cool. You're still with yeah. me. You know, you're still taking care of me. You know, it's the most amazing thing, and I think, I think I'll... A whole lot of people do not realize that. They don't realize when they come out because you do wonder, where am I going to go? Where am I going? You know, we've always been told, we have the sayings of everlasting life. We're the only ones who use the name Jehovah. We're the only ones who... And then when you come out, the biggest surprise you're going to ever find, you're going to go, holy crap, I was lying to about that. God loves me. Even if we were on the prodigal son journey going away from home and we didn't know where the hell we were going and we were going off into all kinds of stuff, God loves you. God loves me. Biggest, biggest thing I ever said. And Angela, too, where like Angela's like, she thought she, it was done. I remember. She's like, it's over. She'd wake up crying, you know, and I'd be like, it's going to be okay. But then all of a sudden, the clouds clear. It's like, if we'll walk through the fear, if we'll walk through the fear, just say, hey, God, I don't know if you're there. Never heard you, never saw you, but I'm trusting there's something there. And you walk you'll find out you are not alone. And that, it wasn't me. And after all, pure 100% love. I mean, it is the most crazy story. And so, anyway, guys, I, I sound like I'm talking. Like, like no, it's all, no, it's all good. But you know, honey, the, the scriptures do say that God promises us that he will never forsake us or leave us mm -hmm. to the very, very end. You don't hear a watch in that, okay? I mean, that's the promise from God. I will never forsake you or leave you. I will be with you all the days of your life. Okay, so he is anchored. And, you know, what I had to do, Dan, is, you know, it's, it's um, your mind is just spinning in so many directions when you leave. <clears throat> because, like you say, your infrastructure, your support system, everything is gone. And anyway, you know, you just get to a point where what I did is I just prayed and I just said, yep. you know, I don't even know how to figure this all out because this is yep. so overwhelming. There's so many religions out there. I don't have time to check out all these religions. I don't even know what direction to go, but I just definitely want to be right with you. I want to be right with you. That's what I want. I wanted peace. 
I wanted peace that surpasses all understanding, and I just wanted to be right with God. And that's all I said. That's all I just prayed. And it just unfolded through time. In other words, you just surrender and you're asking God. It's like you're knocking on that door, Dan. You know, knock on the door and he'll open the door and there he is. But we have to be the ones to knock on the door. He's always there waiting for us. He is, but he's not going to force us. You know, and it's it, 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 um, that that yeah. is so beautiful. Uh, what did Dan do? And it is that simple. Dick has said it many times. It's uh, it's it's very simple. It's simple. There you go. It, it's yeah. just simple prayer. It, 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 if you haven't done it, 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 it is the first time I prayed like that. We just got to help me. That's all it was. It's got to help me. And everything yeah. started to work out, guidance, direction. It, it was that simple. And I was trying to think of something else I was going to say. Um, Oh, I, I lost my thought. Look at how beautiful your life has been and how blessed you are. You know, Dan, I mean, really, you, both you and Angela, you know, Watchtower has it, always tells people, well, where are you going to go if you leave the organization, right? It always has a negative connotation. Where are you going to go, right? But the thing is, yeah. that I think all of us, we have so much peace and happiness in our lives, and it's not that we don't believe in God because we certainly do. We're very godly people today, and we have a great, great relationship with Him more so than if we were Jehovah's Witnesses. JWs are all about legalism, following all these rules and regulations. They're the modern day Pharisees. That's that's no relationship with Jesus Christ, not even close. Yeah, and you know something? I'll tell you. When you get into you know homeostasis, when you get to peace. Your gifts come out. So you cannot find your gifts. Like we've all been gifted. God knit, God, God Almighty knitted you and knitted me together in the womb, right? Right. We are gifted. And I did not get those gifts until I had the peace. When the peace came in the homeostasis, the creativity rose to the top. I was like, oh, I can paint. As what buys me an art said, oh, I can do this. Oh, I can do that. It was amazing what it. They're multi talented. We have no idea. Your gifts wasn't just to pass out watch hours and hold a microphone and pioneer. We are multi talented. We're made in God's image. Jesus said these and greater things we do. We have amazing, wonderful gifts. But if you're working for Watchtower and you're in a trauma based religion and you've chosen that, then you're probably not going to find your gifts. They're shut down, they're buried under fear, doubt, and worry under those spirits. And I'm going to say this too, guys. Just remember the spirit of the flesh. You know what that is. You know it's the eyes, it's the this, it's the that. It's lower attractive. They call them lower attractive bills. Just demonic things that keep you changing your sail. Uh, uh, hopelessness, despair, those are all spirits. So you'll know if you're in the spirit of, of truth or the, or the fruits of the spirit because it's love, joy, peace, harmony, goodness, you know, mildness, faith, self-control. So if you don't have that, if you don't have it, and I never had any of them in Watchtower. I didn't have one of them. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any of them. I had fear, I had, you know, hopelessness, and I wasn't doing enough. It was, it was all the opposite. And so when you start feeling the other ones, when you start feeling joy, it's, and like you said, peace beyond all thought, your creativity rises to the top. Gifts come to the top of your head. You start saying, oh, I can do this. Oh, I can do this. Hey, I'm pretty good at that. I'm pretty... It's like you become who you were meant to be. But it won't happen under darker cultists, guys. Darker cultists are slave owners. They call you slave owners. You don't get to drink at the memorials. Um, you're not part of their group. I mean, they make it very obvious. There's no religion that should ever say you're a good-for-nothing slave, right, Angela? There's no, no religion should ever call you that. No religion should ever tear you away from your family and rip your family apart. No religion should ever tell you not to take blood or to take blood. That's dark occultism. And that is Watchtower. And they're practitioners. And what I mean by practitioners is they won't stop. Their intention is to continue to do what they're doing. That's why I get so upset sometimes while I'm on here. Because I don't like practitioners of darkness. And neither did Jesus. Jesus got in their face. And so when I'm on here, I'm not usually talking to the Watchtower's brothers that are in there, the Pimos, and 
you know, and talk into the governing body because they're practitioners. Jesus says you're whitewashed graves, you're offspring with diapers, you 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 end up with some of those who follow you. And the pit, just think of the pit that people are in right now who follow Watchtower. They're taking the jabs, they're doing this, they're doing that. They're, they're selling their homes out of Watchtower. Everything's changing before their eyes. Could you imagine their minds, how messed up their minds are getting right now? No, you only do have turning the house. Well, what do you mean we did that for years? What do you mean beards? We're in Canada and I saw brothers out door to door with beards today. I was like, you gotta be joking, you dumbass. I'm sorry. You know, I just want to say you dumbasses. I mean, you went all these years without beards and now some freaks in Brooklyn tell you that you can wear a beard and you and you wear a beard with a big grin. And I, I want to say, do you know how much children you are? Do you know how much you've lost yourself? Do you know how crazy you look? I mean, is that too, too strong to say? No. <laughs> right on. They do look strong. They do look lost. They are lost. They look yeah. crazy. You know, Dan, we live in a in a time of deception. Uh, it, it's just overwhelming. I mean, you you watch your politics. You know, you watch you know ten to fifteen million illegal aliens coming in here, bringing fentanyl and drugs and and uh, gangs. And the president comes up and looks you in the face and says, "There's no problem there. You know, so we we got it under control." A watchtower turning around, just selling our kingdom halls, and oh, we're growing, we're growing, you know. And uh, all those people that refuse to have blood transfusions, and they and they died. Well, you know what? Now it's not a a law from God. It is a choice that you have. It, it, it's a um, uh, it's. It, it's a thing of conscience. I just want the audience to know that my phone is, is clicking at me. <laughs> it's a, it's about to shut. Two minutes. I think it's yeah. We, we've been here for three hours. Dan, thank you so much for coming on. You always yeah, bring so much into our team. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I love it. Everybody, everybody brought some good things on, and I just we I've just been sitting back. I've been tuned in probably late. Uh, probably an hour after it started, we just got to the hotel and left my daughter. But yeah. I just wanted to give you a know, but I hope you just like hearing everybody's comments, everybody talking from the heart, everybody healing. Like uh, Eric said, you know, everybody's just putting it out there and being validated. And that guy that's seen his mother at 90 and saying, you know, what a shame my mom has to sit in here and deal with this. I mean, God help him, man. Well, there's hope for people. You know, Dan, that's the thing. We want to leave with people that there's hope, but they have to make the choice to leave the organization in order to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And it's not so terrifying after all. Otherwise, you're living a very unauthentic life, you know, to show up at the Kingdom Hall to be a PMO. You're showing up at the Kingdom Hall, but, you know, you get your, your mind tells you one thing, your heart tells you another. And you're so split on that. You know, you can only do that for, you know, so long. And then it takes its its serious toll on your, your mental health and your physical health. And that's no way to live, to be in happiness. That's right. Awesome job, guys. So I thank you for all the healing. Angela said thank you. We really enjoyed it. And we enjoy it every time. Every time there's a show on here, we try to tune in. We missed Rick's show tonight because we were at a wedding. but. You know, good good job, everybody. Yeah, he's going to be uh, demonstrating outside the Wilmington Kingdom Hall tomorrow, Dan and Angela, for the oh. memorial. So he's not oh, going to yeah. be having, he's not going to have a Sunday show on tomorrow. But uh, yeah, he's going to be. He goes. That's the Kingdom Hall that Rick actually went to. So he goes out there every year at the. I, which time, Rich? What do you think? Seven o'clock? Yeah. Something like that. We would. We used to go up on an hour. Two well, hours ahead, and I had to set up with the, with the signs and so forth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's going to live stream that tomorrow night, so that should be good. People can can watch that. They haven't so, told the kingdom mm -hmm. what they want to get. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> all around it. There's nine kingdom halls, including my my former kingdom halls, the great kingdom hall, all the kingdom halls in Trumpsford. I, I know these are towns nobody ever. Heard about, except if you live in, in Massachusetts, but 
uh, all the kingdom halls all around that area have been sold off. So now all the witnesses go to the Wilmington congregation where Rick was a, a member for a lot of years before he got the scholarship. Uh, yeah, wow, that'll be kind of cool. I can't wait to tune in. When is that tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow night, Dan. So maybe six. at six o'clock, six o'clock Eastern time, which is three o'clock like West Coast time. So that'll be tomorrow wow. night. Yeah. I'd like to go to Canada and just see how many beers are here. It'd be interesting. Oh, you're, in a, you're in a beautiful area if you're up there in British Columbia, Dan. Oh, man, it's mountains. All around the mountains and lakes and waterfalls and it's oh. really something. Oh, that's the that's the well. Be sure to send us some of the wedding pictures. I'd love to see, you know, you dancing with your daughter and all that good stuff. Yeah, it was kind of a it was kind of a little private just of the piece thing. You know, they're going to do a bigger wedding, but they wanted to get married and us be witnesses. So yeah, I'll send you a few pictures. Oh, that'd be sweet, Dan. Yeah. Well, you guys have safe travels, okay? We will. We will. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Yeah, we love you. We love you. Thank you so much for coming on. And then, you want to close? Yeah, I'm going to close by telling everybody, uh, take care. God bless. And we'll be on in two more weeks. And, you know, as Rick always says, you know, hang in there. <laughs> and we love you a lot. Yeah, God bless everybody. Good night.